Okay guys, welcome back. So last lecture start looking at the way how can we build software that manage database in general, okay? We didn't go the, in details, but we start thinking about that, okay? Just to remind you, this course is focused on building desk or eating database management system, okay, in general. So the most important thing when you talk about the desk or you say uh, oriented database management system, I mean here that when you execute any query, you are, maybe there's a chance you need to retrieve the data from the desk that you stored in the lower level, and you have to fetch this one in the memory in order to perform, I mean, the or process your query. We start looking at two different types of way to store the data in general, the non-volatile and volatile, and we said here, the use of non-volatile, I mean, storage is one of the multi characteristics of the database management system here. And we assumed that last time, we said we are not going to distinguish between the hard disk and the uh, SSD drive, okay, with the salt state drive. And one thing, okay, because what I'm planning to do here, in both cases, for the hard disk or the SSD, you are going to do what? You have to fetch the data from the disk, somehow. The data is not in the memory. So we're going to show you all the data structure that we are going to cover, we are going to study here during this class. All of them are going to take a look. How can we fetch something that in the law of, let's say, in the desk or as a blocks and fetch this one into the main memory in order to perform or pro do some processing. Then after that, sometimes we need to reflect the change. I'm aware that when you try to compute the access time, that's the thing that we start looking at last time, Okay, we define this one as a seek time plus rotational delay plus transfer time. That completely different when you if you try to compare the access time for the disk with the SSD. Okay, so in the uh, the salt state drive, generally speaking, this storage that returns that data and it looks like that you have a big flash memory. So we don't have these what is called the uh, mechanical uh, characteristics that associated with the hard disk, but is still the principle the same, is still the goal the same. The data is going to be stored somehow on disk or the SSD or hard disk, but we need to fetch them into the main memory. We still, if we try to compare the access time or the time that's required in order to access the data while it's going to be resides in the main memory, compared whatever SSD or disk, it's going to be expensive. That one is going to be much faster. Clear? Last time we start talking about the access time. We define access time that what? As a time that when you try to fetch the block or the query in the top, ask that I want this block. I want this data. The data is not available in the memory. So what you need to do in this case, you have to fetch the data from the desk and put it in the memory. So the time that when it's computed from started when? At the moment that the command start to eat a block is assured, until the time that the content of this block that I'm looking for is going to be available in the memory, we call this one the access time. So the access time, we define this one as a seek time, a rotational delay, and transfer time. Okay, And we start looking at what do you mean by the uh, seek time. Yeah. So the seek time, I'm talking about the desk, Okay, in this case, is the time that computed as what? The time, remember, the data in the desk looks like something like this. We have a tracks. Okay, and each to see cylinders, whatever how many platters you have. So you have tracks something like this. Now we need just to read to say this block of the data. So first you need to put position the read write or to say the header or the arm that contains the read disk write on the right track or in the right cylinder. So we call this one the time is the seek time. Okay, we are gonna go over with the uh, work with the average seek time. Because here we have the best case scenario. When you try to move this one, you don't need to move because you are in the right track. The worst case scenario, that means you have to move until the end. That's one thing. Plus, every time you try to move this head, you need to have a time in order to start to move. Then after that, you need to have a time in order to stop again. Because it's like mechanical, like a motor. Move, try to control this one, moving back and forth. By the way, I'm not speaking fast, yeah? Okay? And that's why we're going to say this is, I mean, the average time. So average seek time. Okay. 
The second time we talk about last time is rotational delay. Remember, you just position your whatever the header at the specific or the let's say at the right track on the top. Now we need to do what? I need to start reading blocks, okay, for the data. You need to make sure that the beginning of this block or the first sector of this block must be below located or must be positioned under the right head. So sometimes you have two situations. Either you just missed it. Or you are in the right block. You are lucky. You are in the right cylinder. You are in the right block. Now you just start reading. But since we cannot control this one, maybe it's going to be like I just missed it or in the right. So we are going to use what is called the average rotational delay. Okay. How can you calculate in general rotational delay here? Generally speaking, I'm going to give you like speed for the disk. There's an example in the class. Today we're going to cover this one. It's going to be similar. I'm going to have an exam. Okay. And here's the goal just I want from you to understand how it works. Anyway, assume that we have a disk, and I said this speed, a disk is going to rotate 7 to 0, 0 rotational per minute, which the speed that the cylinder, or they say the uh, platter is going to spin, it's going to move, it's going to rotate. Okay, this is the total. You see that 7,200 rotational per minute. So you need to convert this unit to second first. This is the steps that you're gonna, in order to compute the average rotational delay, take whatever rotational per minute is given, which is the velocity, convert this one into seconds, just for simplicity, because this is rotation per minute. So I need to convert this one into second. That means you have to divide this number by 60. Yeah? So, here, 7200 zero, zero, divided by 60. Hopefully, I have the right number. By the way, in the exam, I don't care about the final answer. I just care about the way that you plug the numbers. For example, if you divide 7200 divided by 60, you said the answer 100. I'm going to, it's okay. I'm just take a look at this one here. Okay? Make sure that we have the plug the right numbers. First, to compute this one, now we have rotational per second. Okay? 120. Yeah? Then, the delay is what? Is the inverse of the value. So that means whatever you have, you have divide one, this I'm gonna say delay, is equal to one divided by 120, with rotation per second, okay? Which I think you have, uh, yeah, 0 0.0083 second, okay? Remember, we are going to talk about what? The average rotational latency or delay. This means whatever the number that we have, you have divided this one by two, okay? And make sure that you are going to measure the rotational delay that you're looking for with the same unit that we're gonna use. So generally speaking here, we're gonna use the microsecond, yeah? With the unit. That means whatever the value that we have, you have multiplied by 1000. So this case is gonna be here. We have this one, this we, do the delay without uh, uh, compute the average, just the delay here. In this case, it will be, uh, let's say, 8.33 microsecond, uh, sorry, millisecond. Then after that, you divide this one by two, then you end up, we have the number. So whatever, every time we give you, whenever I give you the velocity, the rotation per minute, you have to follow the same step. Take whatever the number, 7200, Divide by 60, convert this one into a second, rotational per second. Then after that, whatever the value you're going to have here, uh, maybe multiply by 1,000 in order to make sure that you have like what is called the, uh, sorry, 1 over this value, then multiply by 1,000 in order to convert this one to the millisecond, then divide it by 2 in order to compute what is called the average uh, latency, rotational latency. Clear, guys? We need to say, because we have the formula said, the access time, seek time, rotational delay, plus transfer time. Now, I managed to do the following. I put my head, or the read right, or this disk header, let's say, on the right track. And also, now the block, at the, the beginning of the block, or the sector that I want to read, is going to be what? Below the head. Now, what you need to do perform? I need to do what is called the transfer time keeping trans uh, just transfer the data okay so the transfer time is uh, if i didn't give you this one you can compute it as follows so i'm going to i'm going to give you what is called the data transfer rate is given what's the number of bits that you can transfer per second 
Okay. So in this case, the transfer time defined, I mean, defined as following. Is the time that you're gonna take in order to what? For the sectors, for the blocks, it gonna and any gaps, it's gonna be uh, between them, it's gonna be rotate past the head. So assume that I'm gonna do the something like this. Assume that this is one track, something like this. Assume. Okay, we have one, three sectors, and this one block, for example, one block is equal to three sectors. Okay, because 512 multiply whatever. Okay, and between each sector, we talk about this one, we do have a gap here between them. So, that's the transfer time. This is the header. Assume that had like something, reading header, or the disk header, that uh, read write head. Okay, so the time is going to be, this one is going to move something like this one. So, in other words, the these sectors that compose contains this uh, or compose this block is gonna go what? It's gonna rotate past the head. It's gonna go below the head with the gaps. That's what is called the transfer time. How to compute this one? It's gonna depend what the size of the data that you wanted to transfer, which is the block size, divided by how many bits per minute the system is gonna transfer the data, which is the value given by the transfer rate. So the block size divided by the transfer rate is gonna compute the transfer time. Okay, so if you know all these uh, numbers, generally speaking, gonna be the uh, we're gonna use the same unit as I mentioned, gonna be millisecond. Add these numbers, then you can come up with the access time. Let's summarize this one using these uh, figures. First, in order to access data in this, you need to compute what is called I mean, the seek time, which in this case, time to seek for the cylinder, for the specific, the right cylinder or the right track. So here we're just to move this head somehow. Do you remember the head, read uh, right head is gonna do what? And the disk is gonna move uh, back and forth. Yeah, I mean in and out. I mean inside and outside, back and forth. So this is the time. Generally speaking, be between zero and ten microsecond, uh, millisecond actually. Maybe the number is not accurate, but this is just, I mean, estimation is not approximation, not the year one. Uh, it depends, of course, on the type of the hard disk that you work with. But we assume that the number between zero and ten. Why is zero? because maybe you are lucky and you are right now in the right track. Maybe the time is going to be faster, little bit, of course, with the uh, modern hard disk. Then after that, the second one, we need to take a look to the, what is called the rotational delay. So this cylinder is going to be, or this platter is going to move, rotate, spin. Okay, so the time here in order to compute the rotational delay, the time to wait for the sector, for the beginning of the sector or the beginning of the block in order to start I mean, uh, reading. And this one notes, you notice that it's expensive too, between zero up to 10 milliseconds. Of course, this is just estimation, not the accurate numbers. Okay, then after that, now you're starting reading, just transfer the data. So the only thing you need to do, it depends on the, uh, what is called the transfer uh, rate that you have, and the block size that you're gonna read, just this one is gonna pass under the, uh, or rotate past the head, okay? And this time you see it's fast, less than microsecond, well, millisecond. I don't know why I'm keeping microsecond. I think the real data, although most modern hard disk is gonna transfer the data maybe in microsecond, I guess. Actually, the SSD is gonna be the microsecond, yeah. And the uh, hard disk is gonna be in the millisecond, yeah. Okay? So if you take a look here, the graph it looks like the Two times are dominated the delay here, or the axis time. The seek time, and also the rotational delay. For the transfer time is fast. So what we're gonna do here, so in order to enhance, speed up the axis of the disk, we need to figure out or take a look to different ways that allow us in order to enhance or optimize the uh, seek and rotational delays. Okay? Just in order to try to reduce uh, the lower the input outages cost. So what a question, oh, so far just we focus in one block, and other words we talk about it's going to be like a random block. I said just give me a read specific block. So you have to move to the beginning of the block, then start the reading. How about the next block? Just speaking, I'm not going to read one block. Maybe you're going to read two, three, five, six blocks, number of blocks. How about reading the next block? How can you do that? Just speaking, the blocks in the file, we're gonna see starting today, 
okay, should be arranged. This is the best way in order to have or reduce the input out time for, or access the data. Must be or should be arranged sequential. So we can give you an example. Assume that you have this data or this place or the hard disk. If you put one data here, the other one here, the other one here, the other one here, and this one data belongs to one file, and the next block, this is another file, something like this, randomly scattered everywhere, and this is the first third block. Now, if you read the data that belongs to one block, a third one, so you have here, then after that you have to jump here, then you jump here, then you jump here, yeah. So all jump here. If you try to organize these things and disks, you see that you are going to be like perform a lot of seek times. If you time you have to go seek time, rotation and delay, then a little bit going to be transfer time because you transfer this one, and after you're done reading this one, you're going to see that the next block that belongs to different file, you don't want it. Then after that, that belongs to the another file you don't want. So you need just to move to another cylinder, another track, or move over until you find out the next block. So we are going to perform the seek time or rotation degree. But if you compare this one using different story, what if this is the place that I'm going to store my data, I'm going to try to put the data next to each other. So this the red one that blocks that belongs to one file, the blue one that blocks that belongs to the other file. Now, if you read one file, for example, let me have a different color here, uh, black, yeah, you specify or jump to the beginning of the first block that you want to read. Once you're done reading this one, what's going to happen here? You find yourself at the beginning of the next block. So it looks like I'm going to do what here? I need just to do seek time and rotation and delay just in order to find out the beginning of the first block that I want to read. Then after that, I'm going to do what is called the transfer time. Remember, transfer times the time it takes the sectors of the block and any gaps between them to rotate past the head. I just pass, then I find myself where? To the beginning of the first sector of the next block that I want to read. Do we need to have a seek time and rotational delay here? No, I'm already there. I'm lucky. I'm in the right track and the head of the disk head is going to be positioned on or over on the top of the, let's say, the beginning of the first sector of the next block that I want to read. So just to do another transfer time. Once you're done, oh my gosh, I found myself in the third block at the beginning. So another transfer time, and etc. So you see, if you put your data sequential next to each other, this is going to enhance, I mean, the way that, or the input out of the time, or the access time that you need in order to read the blocks of this data. And remember, I'm just worried about the next block, etc. And you just identify the first one, then just you gotta be like smoothly. You don't need to spend a lot of time in order to specify where I need to stop or where the next block and etc. Clear guys? So we do have what's called the next block concept, which blocks gonna be in this this is the best way in order to store your data. The simple thing. I'm gonna do this one. Remember, we have like cylinder. Let's assume that we have two cylinders, just to simplify the process. Then you have two platforms, okay? Of so four servers, okay? So in this case, in order to store your data, what we're gonna do here? First, we're gonna be in the first cylinder. A block is gonna be in the same tracks. Once you're done, there is no space. What they need to do here? Stay in the same cylinder. Then remember, we have two servers. I'm gonna use this service. Then in the bottom, we're gonna continue uh, storing the rest of the block. Once they're done, I'm gonna jump to the next track with the same cylinder. I'm not gonna move. Then here, next. After I done in the both surfs done, I have to I completely utilize all the space in this cylinder. Now you can jump to the next cylinder and continue if you want with the same process. Why I'm gonna do this one? By doing so, in order to perform or access the data, you're gonna have only one seek time, one rotational delay. Then after that, the most of the case is gonna have transfer time. Then. Maybe if you need, in order to jump from one cylinder to another cylinder, maybe it's going to have like a seek time or rotation and delay. But it's going to be once every, let's say, when you try to just to change uh, or jump to another cylinder. Clear, guys? Good. 
So the way that, that's why it's very important, we need to understand how the data is going to be stored in the disk. Of course, someone asked me, they said, oh, it might be difficult to maintain. I agree with you, because the data, there is a cost, by the way. If you keep your data sequential, if your data static, is okay. If your data is dynamic, that means you need to make sure every time you modify the data, delete block, add a new block, a new data, maybe this is going to be scrambled. So it's hard for you in order to maintain this sequential. That means you have to rearrange the data or re-optimize the data again later. For example, use an indexing in order to resort your data, in order to rebuild or keep your data sequential. Of course, there's a cost, but when you try to achieve the data, that's going to be more efficient. So for the sequential scan, that means sequential scan, that means you're going to have one block, then you jump to the next block, and to the end of the block. Mainly when you use sequential scan, in most of the cases, that when you try to achieve all the data that's stored in the file on the relation. Select a style from the relation. So you're going to read the entire blocks, or all the files. Okay? For the sequential scan, since the data next to each other, I can be fetching several blocks at a time, which is going to be have like a big one. Because remember, just an example here, we have one block, the second, the third, etc. When you fetch this one, you're already here. So it doesn't hurt if you fetch this block too. Of course, we're going to see later when you talk about the database management system, the database management system is going to be smart enough in order to tell that it looks like this guy is going to read this block. And then after that, it's going to jump to that block. We're going to show you some examples based on the data structure that we have. The database can tell. Oh, this guy is going to take this, I mean, read this block and other block. Oh, so you can prefetch in advance. So another technique, the way how organize our data on the disk in order to just to try to uh, enhance the input output, or this, let's say, to lower the input output cost, in other words, in order to lower the access time, uh, be fetching this another way in order to perform that. So generally speaking, if you have a double buffer, for example, you have two, you can, you have two blocks or two pages allow you to order to fetch the two blocks at a time. You have two spaces to solve. Staggers blocks, for example, you put the blocks that belong to the relation next to each other, but the same track, then after that, the same, the same cylinder. Yeah? So the time it takes block, I'm talking about the next block, is do what is. It's just proportional to the size of the block. Remember, I'm talking about the next block. For the first block, yes, you have to have the seek time. Plus, you have rotational delay. Okay? Just in order to put the, let's say, the uh, disk header on the right position, on the right track at the beginning of the first structure. When you read the first block, now that means you have like what you call the block size divided by the transfer rate. Okay, that's what you're gonna do. So you read the first block. Now you need to read the next one. Do you need the seek time rotational delay? No, I just have the block size divided by the transfer rate. I just need to compute the transfer time in this case. And continue, continue, continue. Maybe you need just to have plus extra, a little bit delay on that. Sometimes you need to skip gaps. Sometimes you need to switch track. Sometimes you need to one of the way to go to the next cylinder. Yeah, sometimes. So in this case, this time still compared to the seek time and the rotational delay, still this time much smaller, much less. I'm talking about this one here. Okay. So just speaking, we talk about two different access pattern to the desk or the data that's stored in the desk. The one we call this one sequential access. The second one, the random access. The sequential access means you're going to do what? You're going to perform successive, I mean, successive request for successive, I mean, disk blocks. I need a block one, block two, block three, block four, next block, next block, next block. And just speaking, the data hopefully is going to be one uh, data that's going to be stored next to each other that allow me to perform sequential access. Okay? So in this case, the disk seek required only for the first block. The other type of kind of access pattern, we call this one random, okay? Random, that means you are going to read, I mean, a number of, uh, you have a set of requests or successive requests for the blocks that can be anywhere on the disk. For example, you can, let's see, have, maybe the data sequential, so this one, but I need to block one, then I need to block 16. 
Then I need to block 100. Then I need to block 3. You see that you have here, you jump here, you jump here, you back here, you go there. So it looks like you're doing zigzag. Yeah, in this case. That kind of axis is expensive. Okay, compared to the sequential axis. Okay, so the random input out is expensive and the sequential input out much less. So when you try to build or store our data, we try our best in order to store our data in the sequential. And we try to perform what's called sequential access pattern in order to retrieve the data that belongs to the relations. Okay? How about the cost for writing? In order to write, of course, here, the only difference here, the data is going to be not fetched from the desk to the main memory. No, from the main memory, and they're going to store the desk. But you still have one block. You need to store them. Okay? So in order to store one specific block in the data, you need to do the same process, similar to the writing. First, you have to specify, but uh, you had to add, this, let's say, the right cylinder or track. You have to go at the beginning in the first sector that you wanted to store the data on or the, that belongs to the block. Then after that, you do what? You transfer the data and store the data on the desk. Okay? So the cost for reading will be similar to the cost of the writing. But one thing, we need to add some times. We need to double check or verify that we already stored the data. We already managed to store the data on the desk. So in this case, if you want to add the verify cost, in order to the data that you just cited, in this case, you need to add another cost. So the, the writing cost is similar to the reading. You have to perform the seek time, okay? Access time, seek time, plus rotation delay, plus transfer time. Plus, if you want to have a fair byte, oh, in this case, I have to do what? I have to do it. Do you need to do the seek time in this case? If you want to verify what I just write, do you need to seek time? No, exactly, because I'm in the right cylinder. The only thing I need to do what? I need to perform one full rotation, yeah? In order to get back to the beginning of the block, then after that, you have to transfer this one, okay? This is, I mean, the simple way how to perform that. In order to modify the block, it's gonna be similar to read or write. First, you need to do what here? You have to read the block because we cannot process the data while the data is stored in the desk. So you have to fetch this one in the memory, perform the computation, processing, modify, whatever you want to do. Then after that, reflect the change. So it looks like reading, modifying in the memory, writing block. And if you want to verify, that means you are going to add the cost here. Okay? So let's have an example in order to see how can we perform this operation. How can we compute the seek time, access time, and etc. with more details here. Just I need to make sure that I have the right slide here, here, up here. Let's copy here. Okay. So assume that we have, let's say, a disk. A disk has the following characteristics. Okay. We said this rotate at 3600 rotational per minute. With the velocity, with the hardest velocity, the spin or moving. Okay, only one surface. I tracked you. Okay, we have only one surface. This means in this case we have only one platform and one surface. We don't have two surfs. I know the disk, you know, speaking, has two surfs, but here just an example. Okay, we do have 16 megabyte usable capacity. Good. We have 128 cylinders, so we have one to whatever. So 128 cylinders. Okay? We do have the seek time is given. I give you the average seek time. Sometimes maybe I'm gonna give you extra information. Either you need it or you don't need it. In this case, we don't need the adjacent cylinder. In order to move to the next cylinder, you have to add this cost. You need five milliseconds in order to jump to the next one. Okay? We've said here for simplicity at the beginning, one kilobyte block equal one sector. That means here, I prefer to use some, like some, I mean, using uh, a line. So I assume that one sector, this is a gap. This is another sector, this is a gap. And etc. okay? Assume this, that's what's gonna happen with the chart that we have, okay? So we said one block is a one sector. So this one block, this is another block. So the block is equal one sector. 
okay? And the size, one kilobyte, okay? We do have 10% overhead between the blocks. That means when you rotate over this one track, 90% you're gonna go over the uh, uh, sectors, and 10% you're gonna rotate over what is called, I mean, the gaps. Okay, let's put the number here. So when you say one kilobyte uh, equal, uh, blocks equal one sector, so one one, uh, we do have the capacity 16 megabytes, so I'm gonna use the two to the power something as a notation. It's easy to prevent the computation here. So that means here two to 24, yeah? That's how can you 16 megabytes. The number of cylinders here, 128, I'm gonna write this one two to the power seven, because it's easy to perform the computation here, okay? Assume that I want to do compute, for example, the capacity of each cylinder, cylinder. So in order to compute this one, you know how many cylinders we have, 128. You know what's the capacity for the entire disk that we have? It will be uh, 16 megabytes. If you divide these numbers, you're gonna give you like the total, I mean, the size or the capacity or the say the size, you say, yeah, the size of each cylinder. How many bytes can be stored in each cylinder? Clear? I know maybe confused a little bit because you're gonna see 128 is gonna be repeated every time, many times. But it's just this coincidence, okay? So anyway, we do have 128 cylinders, and the size of each cylinder is gonna be 128 kilobytes, okay? How many blocks do we have in each cylinder? If I ask you this question, how to compute this one? Remember, in each cylinder, I do have the size. I know the size, I mean 128 kilobytes. Okay, and I know that one, let's say block, is equal one sector. Okay, I know the size of the block of the sector is a kilobyte, one kilobyte. And I know that the total size of this, uh, let's say, cylinder, 128, and the size of each block is one kilobyte. If you divide this one, you can tell, for example, how many uh, blocks do you have? Which 128? Again, we have 128, it's coincidence, okay? How many number of sectors do you have in each cylinder? Or in one cylinder? 28, yeah? So we're keeping 128, just for this example. So we are fine, okay. So let's take a look here. Now we need to compute what is called, I mean, the access time. Yeah, I'm gonna show this one later. First, let's try to calculate the rotational delay the same way that we did before. Remember we said this one at the beginning of today's lecture, I give you an example how to use this, compute the uh, average rotational delay where the velocity, velocity was 700 to, yeah, 7200, 7, 7, yeah, rotational bit delay. Anyway, here we have 3600 rotational per minute. So I need to compute this one, remove it, I mean, convert from minute to seconds, yeah? Just divide this number by 60. Then after that, I need to compute only one revolution, yeah? And the way that you perform this one, you have to divide one over whatever 60s that you have. So I'm gonna give you like here in this case, this number, and you just convert this one into millisecond, just for simplest, okay? Or if you are lazy like me, give you the number. Okay, I think we have one one thousand in order to convert this one from second into millisecond. So you have sixteen point sixty six. That means this is the time that take in order to perform one complete rotation. Okay, this is one track. Looks like something like this. This is one sector. This is a gap at the next and etc. I want to compute the time, go over useful data. What does that mean? Remember, we said you have 90% when you rotate over one cylinder, uh, sorry, one track, 90% is gonna be over, go over useful data. And 10% is gonna go over, let's say, unuseful data or the data that, of the places that you cannot store information. In other words, go over what is called, I mean, gaps, okay? So here, one rotation, 16, 66 multiply 90% is gonna compute. This is the time in one rotation gonna go over let's say useful data. Time over go over the tabs, gaps, sorry, it will be 10%. So just one rotation multiply 10% give you this value. 
Okay? The time in order to transfer or transfer time for one block. I want to move or transfer one block. When you talk about one block, what's the one block? One block is equal one sector. So this is one block, right? Is this one one block? No. One block only the sector. Do you need in order to transfer one block? In this case, do you need to include the gap? No, there is no need because the block is going to start from here and it's going to be end here. Why need to transfer nothing here? Because one sector or one block is equal one sector. So in this case, I need just to transfer one sector without the gap. So that's what I said. I need to do what? I'm going to use, I mean, the time over useful data, rotate over useful data, divided by the number of blocks that, that we have, which 128 that we computed in the previous slide, and this is the number. So this is the time just to transfer one, or transfer time for one block. If you want to transfer, uh, compute the transfer time for one block plus gap, that means, let me uh, just, yeah, do this one again. So in this case, this time. So I need to have what? The total time, because this one get over, this one rotational delay of the time spent in order to rotate over one track, including, in this case, the useful and unuseful data. Okay? So keep in your mind these numbers. Maybe in the exam you didn't need this one. Maybe in the exam just you need to plug in the number. But here we try to give you different ways, uh, try to compute different stuff. So hopefully in the exam you're going to be familiar. You can compute whatever I ask you to do or ask, ask you to compute, of course. Okay, now the access time. Equal the seek time, rotational delay, plus transfer time. Let's break it down one at a time. So X time, we call this one, one block, okay? So it's gonna seek time. Seek time is given. Rotational delay, you, you need to compute the average rotational delay. We already have 16.66 with the time of one rotation in millisecond. Uh, uh, and you need to compute the average, you need to divide this one by two. Please make sure that you have to divide this one by two in order to compute the average rotational delay. That's what we use here in the rotational delay. Then I need to transfer or the time, let's say, for one block. One block, that means one sector. Do you need to include the gap? No way, because it's on one sector, so there's no need to the gap, because I need, I'm gonna, using the seek time and the rotational and delay, I'm gonna definitely jump, let's say, let's say we have one, let's say two, let's say you need to just to transfer one block, a block number two. So this one, using the seek time and the rotational delay, you're gonna be here, you're already here this point. So we just need to just transfer useful data and stop here. There's no need to go over the gap. Okay? This is the time that we need here. This is the seek time. In order to, when you need to fetch one block using this hard disk, that's the time that you need to wait until this block is going to be available in the main moment. Okay? Why we didn't use the time it takes to transfer one block by a blast gap? I already mentioned, talk about this one. Okay, now let's change something. What if we increase the size of the block? The block instead have only, I mean, gonna be composed or contains only one sector, let's say four sectors. So how it looks like, this is the diagram is gonna explain, illustrate what's gonna happen here. So you have this sector one, sector two, sector three, sector four. This is one block. This is just an example, okay? So in this case is gonna be what the size of the block, one, sector used equal to one kilobyte, yeah, the size. So that's me four sectors, it's gonna be four kilobytes, which is this case here. Good. I need to compute the access time. Again, we need to have the seek time, we need to have the rotational delay. Do you think the seek time and rotational delay is gonna be changed or not? Compared to, well, no, because you have to, Find out the begin, you say the right cylinder, regardless one block, one thousand block, I don't care. And also you have to rotate and to make sure the beginning of the first or the first sector, the first block is gonna be under your whatever your uh, header that you start reading the data. Clear? Good. Then here the interesting thing here. Let me go walk you through this one. I'm gonna read from here up to here. Right? So this one, what I'm gonna read? One sector plus gap. Two sectors plus gap, the third sector plus gap, and stop here. So the three multiply with a sector plus gap, okay? Then here plus, and it just read one sector without gap. 
we do have the times. We compute that before, yeah? We compute the time that we need to know the transfer time for one block or one sector to say uh, using uh, with gap and without gap. Okay, remember, let's go back here. These numbers. But remember, this one block used to be equal one sector. So it looks like one sector here. Remember, the, the, it's given at the beginning, one block is equal one sector. So this time, in order to read one sector, and this guy is going to be compute to read one sector plus gap. I need to do this one three times, and I need to do this one only one time to compute the time in order to have, I mean, the right transfer time. And that's what we did here. The time to read one sector without gap, and this is the time to read uh, three sectors with gaps, and this is the third time. You see that if you increase the size of the block, now we spend less time and you're gonna manage to read more or large amount of data. And again, this is the time that uh, is the access time, is the time when they issue the command that we need the block in the memory until the, memory, the block is gonna be available in the memory. So you see now you can't compare that. You see that if you figure out a way in order to keep these blocks available in the memory, as needed, so maybe it's gonna save this amount of memory all this time. Okay, just think about what's the time to read the full chart. Just compute this one. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at some optimizations. What we can do here and make it faster to reduce the input output time or overhead. Okay. I'm gonna go over this one. I didn't need to spend long time on this one because I think this mainly you cover this one operating system, but it doesn't hurt if you go over this one in this class, okay? There's many optimizations, okay? Uh, the first one, you can do what's called disk scheduling algorithms in order just to speed up the access to the data. Maybe we can use, the, say, a larger buffer. Maybe we can perform, for example, a prefetching or also now double buffering. I'm gonna go with an example here. Maybe you can use what's called a disk array. Maybe you, can, you have a multiple disks, so that means organize, organize or let's say distribute your data among, let's say, number of uh, disks, okay? Or maybe you're gonna use, for example, on-disk cache, which allow you instead to have a go deeper, try to figure out the data seek time, etc. maybe the disk itself is gonna have a cache. So if you try to find something, you didn't find it in the memory, go to the disk cache. If you find it, then you're gonna achieve it, if not, fetch it to the disk cache, then after that, fetch the memory. So later, if you need it, you're being able to access this one. So we have a multiple ways uh, technique in order to optimize that, okay? So disk scheduling, I think you are aware or familiar with this one in the operating system. You cover this one, you have many scheduler techniques. Okay, so here in this case, when we have multiple access or multiple requests, or maybe, for example, you have a query set, I want to block one, another one to block three, another one to block seven, another one 18. Because remember, you are not the only one that works here, okay? So if you have a multiple request, okay? Then you try to read or write data. So here I need to define what's called the surface policy, which the way that we define which order the disk controller is going to process or surface the request that you received. One simple solution, name serves, we call this the first end or first come, first serve. So if I receive a request to go, for example, let's have assumed that this block is gonna be block one and gonna be, let's say, cylinder one. And this is gonna be cylinder three, cylinder seven, and cylinder 18, just to show you what's gonna happen here. So at the beginning, the first come, first serve, okay? Let's have... Uh, Another one, just an entire example, two, for example, okay? Something like this. Anyway, the first come, first serve, that means I received something to get the block from the first cylinder. I'm gonna jump to the first cylinder, okay? I read this block, for example. Then after that, something go to the third cylinder, okay? So I'm jump to the third cylinder. I'm gonna serve this one. Remember, seek time. Uh, rotational delay is going to be added up, yeah? So I have to perform access time too, in this case. Then after that, I said, jump to, let's say, uh, cylinder, let's do two here. Yeah, just to give you an example. Then after that, jump back to two. I'm here. Then jump to the seven. 
I'm here. Then jump to 18. And you are here. So maybe someone's got go back to the cylinder one. Then after that, go back to the cylinder 18. You see that? Because right now, the first come first serve, I cannot guarantee the request is gonna come, it's gonna be in order. Or it's gonna be organized. So I'm gonna be jump back and forth. So it looks like here we have a huge, it was gonna be the access time, it's gonna be too large. It's gonna be expensive here. Can you do better here? Yes, we can use what is called the elevator. Okay, algos. Well, I'm familiar with elevator, yeah? Well, elevator you start from whatever you call the elevator, let's say in the first floor. You just press the button, the elevator is going to be there. When you get in, the elevator maybe is going to do what? It's going to wait maybe a little bit. Maybe there's some another request is going to come or another person try to log in. I know you're going to lock, close this one directly. Some people are going to say, don't like to have someone else, they're going to share them with the elevator. So it's going to try to close the door. Yes, assume we don't have this button. Okay, so we are on the first floor here. So the operating system, or, or the, let's say the disk here, in this case, is going to do what's the scheduling. See whether there's anything it can serve, whether anyone wants anything from this cylinder. If anything, let's do it now. So I don't care about first come, first serve. It depends whether there's any request going to belong to this uh, uh, input out or to either or right that belongs to this uh, cylinder or not. Then after that, go to the next. So it looks like you go back and forth here, and every time it's gonna do what? Based on the cylinder, and every time we try to see whether there is any request can I serve when I reach the cylinder or not. This is not fair, I mean, it's unfair, but it's efficient. Compared to the first come, first serve, that one is gonna be inefficient, but firm. Yeah, you see the trade off, but I believe, I mean, the uh, elevator algorithm is gonna be better way in order to perform this operation. Okay. Okay. The other thing that we can do is called the double buffering, which is an interesting thing. That in this case, I can speed up access to data in general by using double buffer. That means you have two space, two extra space. For example, you have one block, maybe you have another block. So if you fetch one block, you can fetch another block at the same time. I mean, uh, uh, while you are there, okay? Because you have enough space there. That's what you call prefetching here. This is gonna be later when you talk about the database management system, you're gonna see how can you utilize this one? Because you're gonna see later, the database management system knows exactly somehow, I mean, especially when you start doing your query, that maybe you're gonna need this block or the next block. We're gonna see later when you talk about the query optimization in more details, okay? So let's see how it works here. So assume that, one file, when you say file relations, and this file has a sequence of blocks. Block one, block two, block three. And you are going to read them. You read the first block, the second, the third. Okay? So you need to have a program, or assume that we have a program action. This is going to take uh, process, process, I mean, the first block, the second, and the third, and the end of the uh, blocks in this file. Good. Let's take a look at the symbol of naive solution. We do have only one buffer. This means I have only one buffer that allow me in order to use the data processing. Once it's done, I have to fill this one with the next block. So first you need to read the first block. You see on this file, P1, P2, these are the blocks somehow stored here. So first you have to fetch this one into the buffer. Then after that, you need to process the data. Then after that, of course, after you pass the data, either you're going to store, assume that you process and consume. We don't care about you're gonna, what's going to happen after you process the data. Okay? Then we're going to read the second block, do the processing, then read the third, and etc. So the time here, just to give you like notation, assume that we have the P, which is the time that you need in order to process, required to process one block. The R, the time that you need in order to read one block. And then it's going to be how many blocks you need to read that belongs to this file, okay? So in order to read one block, then you're going to consume what? But this one in the buffer, that's being reading, you are going to cost you our time, whatever the value, many second, second, whatever, okay? Microsecond, whatever. Then when you process the data within the buffer, you're going to spend the say, you say R, yeah? Oh, sorry, you use P yeah, as a process, okay? So the reading, one process. So for each block, I need to perform what? One time read plus one process. 
I need to perform or repeat this operation how many times for any blocks. So this is the cost or the time in order to read and process the entire any blocks that's gonna be cost P n multiply R plus P using only one buffer. Okay? Let's try to do a better solution. What if? If we can say uh, two buffers. So it looks like assume that you have one buffer here, one buffer here. The solution here, just read one block, but in one buffer, while you are processing the data in the first buffer, you can read simultaneously the next block to the next buffer. Once you're done processing the first block, move the control to the next block in order to start processing whatever you have there, and while in this case, simultaneously read the third block into the first buffer, and continue doing this one. That's what we call the double buffer. So here, we have the memory, for example, and this is the disk. Yeah, assume the data is going to be A, B, C, D, or P1, P2, whatever. Then I'm going to read one block here and start processing here. While I'm processing this block, I'm going to do what? Simultaneously read the next block to the other buffer, or the next buffer, or the buffer number two. Okay? Once this one done processing, now I'm jumped to this one, I'm processing this one, and here I'm reading C here. Yeah? Which is going to happen here. Okay, let's try to estimate, estimate, I mean, what's called the processing time here. We're going to use the same notation. P is going to time to process and R one block and R the times in order to read one block. Okay, n number of blocks. And assume that the time that's spent in order to process one block is greater than the time that needs in order to read one block. Okay, just this notation do that help us in order to estimate the processing time. Good. Now, you're going to do what in this case? You have to read, spend one time to read the first block. Then after that, you're going to process the first block. Yeah. While you process this one, you're going to read the second block. Yeah. But remember, since the processing time is greater than the reading time, so the processing is going to do what? It's going to dominate it, I mean, the time to read the next block. So how many processing data here I need to process in blocks? So the over the time that the processing time is going to be read the first block, then after that the reading the rest of the block is going to be dominated by the processing the first until the last block. Yeah. So in this case, R plus n multiply p. If you compare this one, if you have a single buffer with a naive solution that you came up with, so it's going to be n multiply R plus p. So you see that by using double buffer, we have enhanced orders by factor n. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting better. Of course, you need to have extra space, you need to manage the extra buffer, but that's what we're doing here, yeah? Just try to make sure that the system is much faster, so this, like, the tracks that you try to use in order to make it faster. You can use what, call, what is called, I mean, the disk array here, in order just to speed up the disk access. Okay? So one thing, you can multiple disks, okay? And since we have a multiple disk, for example, here, we have disk 1, disk n, yeah, 1 up to n, for example, if you have, let's say, three disks, so if you organize or distribute the data among these three disks here, you can here ask each of them is going to have its own read-write headers, yeah? So you can do reading going to be faster, and it depends by the way, the way how you organize your data. Either you have the same copy of the data, or maybe you are going to organize the block among different uh, uh, disks. Okay? So we have different ways to perform this one. So block serving, uh, mirror disk, and read. We have different ways to perform that. Yes, try me. Yeah. So the first one, I'm still we have a multiple disk. But in the first technique, I need to do what here? I'm going to store the blocks of the file over multiple disks here. So what does that mean here? You have the file. The file has block 1, 2, 3, and such. So what I'm going to do here, the disk 1 has a block 1. The disk 2 has a block 2. The disk 3 is going to have a block 3. So you see that if you have the data here, you can jump here. If you need to add the data from the other disk, uh, that's next block or third block, maybe it's going to be this disk, and if you need the data uh, from the other block or 
the third block maybe can perform this operation in the third task. So you distribute the data among different or number of tasks here. This is gonna enhance the reading your operation uh, and uh, the right here, yeah, because you organize the data. But if the system fail or something happened bad in the system, so you have a problem in order to recover from these errors. Yeah? Because if you lost the formation here, there is no way in order to recover the formation because you have the block one is gone here in this case. The other thing we can use mirror disk. What does that mean here? I'm gonna store the same data on multiple disks. If you are familiar with the read, I think this one is gonna be read zero or one, I don't remember, I think read one, the mirror. Anyway, so you have one disk, I assume two disks here. I put hold the data here in this case, and another copy, the exact copy is gonna be in another disk. So the reading operation is gonna be, for example, n fast, time fast, if you have n or disk available, yeah? But the writing operation is gonna be similar to the one disk, because we have to read, write, or update one place, then after that, you have to make sure the data is gonna be consistent with the rest, that means you have to duplicate or replicate the change there, yeah? You can generalize this one. I think this one will be zero. This is, I think, read one. I don't remember, but I guess mirror disk is going to be read one, which we have the redundant arrays of inexpensive disk. With the technique that you use, either it's going to be software or hardware, which allow you in order to uh, increase the speed and access uh, of access of the data and the reliability of the disk in general. And the reader have a different levels. Anyway, so how can we? Take a look, I mean, react or to say, uh, cope with what is called the disk failure. Because disk is like what? Like any other device, uh, let's say, subject to failure, to crash. Yeah? So sometimes here we have different types of error. Let's take a look at quick of them, although maybe we are not going to cover them here. I'm not uh, cover the problem of the disk itself because the operating system is going to have different ways in order to deal with this one. Okay? So anyway, the first one is like, Sometimes you have intermittent, I mean, uh, read failure or write failure. That means my disk is fine, okay? The only problem is that sometimes you try to read, retrieve or access the data from the block, it's kind of takes time. You said, for example, I cannot recover, I cannot recover, I cannot read the data. But if you keep try, trying maybe five, six times or number of times, you're going to get the data back, okay? So that's why maybe it's not permanent uh, power in the disk. Okay, the second one we call this one media decay. This means the disk starts worn out. This means this, maybe you have one sector, we have a bad sector, we try to read the data or store the data in the sector, the sister, se uh, not the sister, the sector. Okay, it's gonna be uh, uh, scratch or bad, cannot store this information in the sector. Yeah, how can you deal with this one? If you're old like me, you're going to be familiar with kind of error. When they words, sometimes you spend time, maybe a few minutes, just to try to retrieve the data that's stored in one block. Uh, bad sector, that one famous error message that we faced when I was young. Now I'm old. Yeah. So one way to perform that, to get over this one, you know, to mitigate or cope with this kind of error, you need to do what? You have maybe move whatever you have in the sector, the bad sector, in another sector. Yeah, and you uh, let's say uh, mark this bad sector as unused, so you are not going to use this one anymore. If we have this keep keeping have this problem uh, over and over, the size of the hard disk is going to be maybe enough, nothing left in your so, store uh, information in the disk. That's happened mainly in my days. Right now, maybe I think the uh, most of the hard disks are reliable, and mainly we can use the cloud in order to store my data. So I have many techniques in order to uh, cope with these kind of errors. Permanent failure, which that means your system, uh, hard disk crash. Okay, and especially if the disk has, has scratched, I mean the plagiars, uh, then in this case the data is going to be completely lost. How can we? Uh, mitigate or cope with this kind of error or mistakes. For the hard disk, there is a chance you're not going to recover any information from this hard disk, but we can use archive, you have a duplicate or mirror, that means you have always, we have a backup of this file or your data, so in order to get back return or, or store whatever you have here. Install that data. Okay, we talk about this one, I need to go over them again.
Okay. So that's, I mean, the first part of the hardware. So just to give you an idea what's going on in the secondary storage, yeah, and we just mainly focus on the disk. Hopefully by end of, by covering this part, now we are convinced that the input out of disk operation is ex expensive. Okay? Compared if the data is gonna be resides in the memory. So we try to avoid this kind of operation as much as we can. So it looks like when you build our database management system, we need to figure out a way in order to try to mitigate this effect or just use X the data from the disk. Okay? If you are interested to read more about this part, yeah, I already add a new uh, folder in the Blackboard. You're gonna see that, I think, uh, reading folder. Yeah, I call this one reading. You're gonna see chapter one, there is a file, PDF file. You can upload or download in your, uh, and read. It's gonna cover the first part that we covered last lecture, the introduction. The chapter two is, is, gonna, uh, uh, is going to talk about the data storage which is gonna give you some details about what we cover today here. And we're gonna use this one also in the next lecture, okay? The, those are the sections that you need to read them in order that what we cover in today's lecture. So now we're gonna close this part and now starting looking at how can we starting building our database management system, which is the goal that we try to achieve here, okay? Is there any question relating to, uh, related to what we cover so far? By the way, if you have a question and you post your question in the Piazza, the TA is going to uh, actually start today looking at the Piazza and going to answer your question, if you have any question. Okay. So the second part, we're gonna talk about what's called the data storage. I call this one part one. We divide this one in multiple parts, okay? So if you interest, to read more from the textbook here, we have another different resources. The database system, this one is gonna be covered the shutter tool. You already have access one, it's gonna be available in the Blackboard. Yeah, data storage, or there's another resource if you're interested with chapter 10 for the sixth edition for this textbook, or chapter 13 if you use the seventh edition. By the way, if I suppose not say that, but copy the database concept, uh, this title, searching, in the internet, definitely gonna find the sixth and the seventh edition. So it's available there. You can use them. Anyway, so starting last lecture with uh, this class, we need to learn how to build software that manage database in general. Okay? Our system design goal here. We are going to start and build the software that manages the database. Okay? What's the goal that we try to achieve here? And we want that to provide that's like an allusion to the user or the database application or anyone, that, uh, the user that use our database that we have enough memory in order to store the entire database in memory. Yeah, when, what do you mean by this allusion here to give the user in, in a way that I'm going to hide or every time if the user try to access the data from the disk, I'm trying to hide this uh, complexity to the user. In other words, we, I'm trying to minimize the impact that every time the application tries to access the data from the desk, okay? So I'm trying to find a set of techniques that allow me to find a way in order to keep the pages or the blocks that the user asks for in the main memory. This allows to manage the database that exceed the amount of the memory available. Again, the data stored in the desk. Then you need to find a way in order to fetch the data, data to the main memory once the user asks for the data. And the reason behind this one, I'm trying to reduce the number of disk input output of operations because these kind of operations are expensive. So I'm trying to avoid the larger styles and the performance degradation. So let me show you here with more details. So at the beginning, we're gonna start from the scratch. We're gonna talk about what is called, I mean, the database file here. So the database file, which is the file we are going to store on the disk, can be stored as a sequence of a blocks of the data. So here we can say, let me write here the database file. It might be files or files, okay? So this one is gonna be in the disk. Assume this, uh, the whole, this is in the hard disk, this part, okay? So the database file is gonna be stored as a blocks. So I have maybe one, 
set of blocks of the data. Okay, I'm gonna show you today, starting with today, how can you do that? Okay, and the first block we're gonna have what is called I mean special I mean uh, block that helped me in order to find my way access to these blocks of the data here. So we call this one here the directory. Okay, so we call this one actually, yeah, directory, which is to help me find, navigate my way inside the file. So again, I have a file. The file is gonna be, uh, I mean, uh, stored as a blocks of the data. Each block is gonna be stored in the disk. So for example, this file one, a block one, block two, and etc. I need to find the data structure in order to find my way within this database file. Because if you, uh, store just to store the blocks in the disk and you are going to lose the track for the blocks You need to find a way in order for example for every single file I'm going to tell you for example what do you need? I need a block one. This is a block one. Where is the next block? There. Where is the third block? Uh, over there and etc. That's what we're going to do for the for first coded assignment. You are going to create a file using um, C language and inside the file, you need to find a way in order to store the data inside the file as blocks. Okay? This is the first one. Then, at the higher level, the next level, level, what do we have here? We have what is called, I mean, the uh, buffer pool. Okay? Of, of the, the buffer pool is going to do what? It's the unit that's responsible in order to fetch the data back and forth from the disk to the main memory. So here the buffer pool, the same thing here. We do have a limited space. Of course, we cannot take the whole moment. It's going to be the buffer pool. So assume this is, we have these spaces that we have the buffer pool. All of them are empty at the beginning. Okay. So we start with the file. The file is going to be uh, breaked up into a number of uh, blocks. And these blocks are going to be stored in the desk. Then we need to find a way inside the files that will allow me to find my way, which block I need, I need to retrieve. We're done from this part. This is what's going to happen with the disk. Then the higher level here, we do have what is called the buffer pool. Okay? And assume that we have a user here, or the request is asked, for example, I need page, let's say, whatever, let's say, assume that I need page number one. Okay? So the page number one, if I got any request from the higher level, the first thing the buffer pool is going to check and make sure whether the, I have a copy from the block that resides in the memory or not. If it's not, I need to do Fetch, I mean, the director of the file, yeah? So the director is this one, I have a copy from the director, it's gonna be here. Then within this director, it's gonna tell me, for example, you want page one, page one is located, let's say, in disk, uh, specific disk, disk, a specific, I mean, cylinder, number, a specific, I mean, uh, track, and etc. and specific block number. So all this information is gonna be given here. So I can then after that get back and fetch which block I need, so the first block is going to be uh, available in the main memory. Then after that, I'm going to apply where, let's say, the blo block number one is going to be half, for example, this is the pointer for the block number one, so you can start working with it. Okay? So, again, this is the first coding assignment. going to find a way how to store your data as a uh, files in the, as a blocks in the disk. Then after that, we're going to implement the second uh, the other assignment or the second coding assignment you're gonna call the buffer pool which allow me in order to fetch the blocks that is not available in the memory from the disk to the main memory. Okay? Back and forth. Okay? So what do you mean back and forth? Usually when you fetch blocks to the main memory, uh, the the block is gonna maybe it's gonna be written or updated. So yeah, maybe we're gonna make minor modification to the block, so we need to store the block back to the desk here. That's it. Okay? So, after that, what we need to take a look here, we need to see what the contents of the block. How can we store, let's say, records inside, I mean, the uh, blocks? Because remember, we are working with a database, yeah? Mostly we're going to work with the relational database. And the relational database is a set of what? A set of what is called, I mean, the, uh, I mean, it's going to be uh, tuples, yeah? Records. So I need to find a way how can you store the record within the blocks, which is going to be, this is the third coding assignment. That's what you're going to do with the third coding assignment, okay? Within the record, you're going to see that how can we store the attributes inside the, the record itself? 
Because you're going to see, for example, you're going to deal with different types of attributes. Uh, char, var char, I mean, it might be integer, it might be uh, date, times 10, etc. So we need to find and figure out a way how can we store this data, which is going to be the third coded assignment. Okay, then after that, in the top, we're going to see later, now I need to speed up the access to this data. So we are going to build the index, and we call this index, in our case, it's going to be plus 3. This is the fourth coding assignment. So the first, uh, fourth coding assignment is going to, uh, this data structure is going to help me in order to figure out uh, or speed up the access to the data. Okay? So that's what we try to do, and this is, I mean, allow us in order to build the way can, how can we store the data in the disk, how can we fetch the data back and forth to the main memory, then how can we store the data inside the blocks, and then after that, how can we build this in the index structure that allow me, you know, the speed to speed up the access of the data. Okay, that's what we try to cover uh, mainly in this class. Of course, at the top of that, we're going to study different mechanisms. One of them, for example, how can we recover from the uh, failure crash? And also, how can we achieve concurrency control? We are going to just only, to, I mean, to I mean, study the theoretical part of these, uh, I mean, uh, components, without, but we are not going to have time in order to implement or perform any implementation. Okay? Yeah, it's clear. Okay. So the question here, why we are going to waste our time and try to build the mean buffer pool and also try to, for example, uh, take the file and divide the file in the blocks and restore the blocks in the desk. We need to do this one by ourselves. Why we cannot rely on the operating system in order to do this job here? Simple answer, the database knows better than, I mean, uh, database system knows better than operating system. When you start, I mean, building our database management system here, when you start talking about the way that how can we create the blocks, how can we create, also, I mean, store the uh, tuples inside the blocks, and also how can we arrange the block within the desk, the database management system is going to be familiar, be aware with the content of the data. So it's going to have a better idea, so the database management is going to be, better, I mean, in a better position than to decide which block we're going to keep in the main memory, which one we need to uh, get at, uh, how can we ex access the data, how can you anticipate, for example, this for example, this query is going to fetch or perform what you call sequential scan, uh, and etc. Okay, and it's going to be much clearer with the time when you start talking about the buffer pool with more details. You're going to see sometimes you need to flush the dirty base. What do you mean by the dirty base? That means that the base of the blocks that resides in the main memory of the buffer pool, the content is changed. So we need to reflect the change to the disk. If you are going to rely on the operating system, the operating system is going to wait until the block is going to be full, then after that it's going to perform, for example, the uh, right operation to the desk. But sometimes we need to perform, for example, the eviction or the flush, the dirty page right now to the desk. So in this case, because the buffer, I mean the database management system, we're going to see that later when we talk about the uh, logging techniques that allow uh, us to know that to perform the recovery from the failures, from the crash failure, require from us to perform the, update, um, the flush date right now, not wait later. And also, we can perform what's called specialized prefetching, one of them, a double buffer, uh, uh, fetch, if you have a double buffer, I know exactly how the data works, so I know exactly which block I need to uh, fetch, because I am aware of the content of the data, I'm aware of how the data is going to work. Uh, better buff buffer replacement policy, and also uh, better uh, performing the third and pass schedules. The most important thing you can think about this one, the operating system is not your friend, um, but I'm going to show you that there's a few places that we need to rely a little bit about the database, okay, I mean the operating system. So right now in the database stores, we do have two problems we're going to start looking at right now. The first one, we try to cover this one today. So the first one, how the database represents, I mean, uh, database on files on disk. You have the database system you need to build, and your data is stored as a file. Yeah, and you need to take this file and store it in the desk. Of course, when you store this one in the desk, you have to represent this one in blocks. Okay, in more details, we need to take a look how to lay out the files in the desk as the blocks, and also how to lay out the data on desk. 
more details. And the second part we need to think about to take a lot of that, how the database manage its memory and move the data back and forth from the disk, which is the part that we're going to take care by the buffer pool. So today's agenda, I'm going to take a look at the first one here. How can we organize the database across this say, uh, sequence of blocks with the file storage? Because the file storage is going to be, it's going to be a, a blocks of data. Yeah. For example, maybe you have five or six blocks. Then how can we arrange these blocks? We're going to put this one next to each other. You're going to use a specific data structure in order to allow, uh, allow you, for example, in order to which order you are going to need to follow in order to store your data. And then after that, we're going to take a look, how can we lay out the, uh, the tuple inside the base? So we're going to take a look one at a time, okay? So, so generally speaking, the database is going to do what? The system is going to store, I mean, the database as one or more files on desk, okay? It might be used a file hierarchy, so or it might be used a single file. It depends what kind of database get we use. If we use a SQLite, this means one file database is gonna store only in one file. The other database mainly is gonna use like file hierarchy. That means there is the structure of the data. I'm not going to store all the database on one file. It's gonna be a number of files, of set of files. And if you take a look to your favorite database system, you're gonna see that how the file or database is gonna be stored. So we don't have a single file. We have a number of files. Okay. And uh, the most important thing, when I'm storing these data on the desk, the database, uh, the operating system doesn't know anything about these files. The only thing that the operating system can see the data on the desk as a sequence of bytes. What does that mean? I don't know. If you ask the operating system to interpret or explain what's going on inside this one, it's going to say, I don't know. There's only sequence of bytes. Okay, the only one that can understand, I mean, the content or can decide what's going on inside these sequence of bytes is the database management system. And the reason why behind that, because the database management system know exactly what the structure of the, I mean, this file, because who all create these files or these blocks of the data? The database management system, okay? Uh, storage manager is the software component that is responsible for what? For maintaining our database file on disk, okay? Within these files. And we will organize them, uh, I mean, as a collection uh, of pages. So the simple thing here, the software, this is the software, a set of software that's responsible in order to work with the files. Store the files as the blocks and organize them as a collection of pages. Okay? And in a collection of pages, we need to keep track of the following. It's not like you just want to store the data and then good luck to find how can you find these uh, pages. We need to find an organized way. We're going to show you different data structure that we can follow that allow us to organize the base, uh, the files as a base, and also allow us in order to track what the data they read, uh, the writing of two pages, and the available space, and more different, I mean, uh, extra information that help me in order to find my way or get some useful information about the blocks that's stored on the desk. So the first thing we take a look here, the database page here, okay? And the database management system is gonna organize, I mean, the database across one or more files in the fixed blocks. And sometimes we call it blocks of data or sometimes called page, okay? So the page, generally speaking, is what? Is a fixed size block of data. So if we take a look to the page, this is the page, okay, or block. It has a fixed size, okay? It's not variable, okay? It can contain the tuple, okay, metadata, index, log record, that means the content that you're gonna store to this block of this page is gonna be anything. It might be anything, okay? When I say, uh, it might be actual tuples, you know what you mean by actual tuples, for example, you have a relation called student. And this student is gonna have the list of, I mean, student, I mean uh, the scheme of this relation, student ID, name, and GPA, for example. So assume that we have 100 tuples of this data, this is what you mean by the actual tuple. I need to find a way in order to store this tuple inside this block. Uh, the uh, beige or the blocks can uh, contain um, for, uh, the metadata itself. I can store the metadata in the block. I can store the index data. Later, we're going to talk about the index. I'm going to show you how can we build the index, what data structure we're going to follow in order to build the index. So generally speaking, at the end, it's going to be a file. Since it's a file, it's going to be can be uh, organized as a sequence of blocks. Yeah, it might be log record. It's going to be it's going to be the content that be stored in this. I mean base. So we have many bases. Uh, many data types, okay? So most systems don't mix base types. For example, uh, 
I'm not gonna, uh, most of the system does, uh, don't prefer to have this fact, for example, I'm gonna fill this one with uh, half of the page, for example, with the uh, tuples, okay? Then maybe after the sum of the uh, uh, tuples that's gonna be, or data that's gonna belong to the index file, and the other data that's gonna belong to the rep. So you have a mixed data. Most database uh, system doesn't do, don't do that. So they have, for example, one page, for example, or a specific number of blocks that's only for the data, and they have another blocks uh, or a specific number of blocks for the log entries or log record, and they have another uh, separate block in order to deal with the index. Okay? Uh, some database require the page to be self-contained. What does that mean here? When you build your page, or create your page, something like this, you need to keep all the information that you require and they need in order to... Uh, Interpret, I mean, the information about the page must be stored in the page itself. Okay, it's gonna be much clearer later when you start put data into the page. When you start with what I mean, the uh, record of the page, and after that, you're gonna see, oh, that that makes sense. Okay, so how can we access this page? Each page is gonna have unique number ID number, so we can use uh, say it's gonna have like page number or page ID. It's like logical, uh, I mean, uh, identifier for this page, yeah? So the database management system is gonna use this in order to do like interaction layers or mapping the page ID to the physical location. You know, this is the page ID, for example, equal one, okay? What does that mean here? This means it looks like we have a table, mapping table, it's gonna say the page ID one, and it's gonna tell me what's the exact location of the page on the disk. And you know, last lecture we talked about how can we store the data on the disk. So we are familiar. We all expect that this the physical address must contain the disk ID, the cylinder number, and let's say the track number and the block number of the offset inside the track and etc. Okay. So in the higher level, remember when I showed you at the beginning of today's lecture, when you say the higher level, someone is going to ask, I want, for example, beige. Uh, let's say. Uh, the query engine or execution, they're going to say, I want the page number one. Okay? So the page number one here, somehow, the store, I mean, uh, so the storage manager, you would have what? You turn this one into the file in order to look up in this table in order to find the exact location in order to find the page that you're looking for. Okay? So the simple thing that the, the file is going to be uh, stored as, let's say, a sequence of blocks. Or pages. The base of the block is gonna is a fixed size, okay, that contains more, more, I mean, uh, different many database, uh, data, I want to say base types. Uh, when you talk about the base type, it's gonna be tuples, might be data tuples, might be metadata and index on log records. And we emphasize that most systems don't mix, I mean, the database types. So when you have a file, I mean, a blocks, I'm gonna keep information that belongs to the same. The relation of the same uh, uh, data type in the same place. So, the reason behind why do we have a fixed size? The fixed size just to, in order to make my our life easier, okay? Because if you have the database size different than, let's say, uh, the operating system uh, base uh, or the block size. So now you need to do a lot of conversion between whether the size is larger, whether the size is smaller. Uh, if you try to use, I mean, variable size base, that's gonna be not easy for you to get. Need you have to do, I mean, to do a lot of engineering overhead in order to make sure that to support these variable size. Okay. And one example, for example, if you have a variable size and we need to delete this one from, let's say, the file. It's not easy for you in order to fill this one with the new page because you are looking for the page that can fit in this space. So it was now we take a look to the data, I mean a page in general, a blocks. It looks like we have a different notation of the pages in the database management system. In the lower level, we have what is called, I mean, the hardware page, which is the one that, that we have in the desk level. Okay? So different storage device has a different page size. Usually they have four kilobytes. This is the one, let's say, assume that when, that what we covered last time, we'll talk about the desk, how the data can be stored the desk. We assume that we, the small unit, the small cell of that we can retrieve the data was a sector, but sector is small, that's why we're gonna introduce what is called the page or the block. So the block, that's what I'm talking about. This is the hardware page, okay? So that's, as I said, this is our level. We have what's called the uh, hardware page, and this is the size, okay? Four kilobytes. 
Uh, above from the hardware, we have what's called the operating system page. So the operating system is going to operate over the hardware. Okay, and the size of the operating system uh, page or block usually four kilobytes. It depends by the operating system. Yeah, in this case. Then after that, we do have what is called the database page here. So the database page was the one that, for example, I'm gonna take a lock from the storage device and put it in the memory. Uh, let me do this one here, quick here. So you can see on that we have in the lower level here. You have this operating system base, uh, the hardware base. I'm gonna write H the hardware base, for example. Then after that, in the top, we have the other base. We call this one the operating system base. And the operating system base will take whatever we have in the disk and put it in the buffer pool. That one is gonna be like. That's why I said in the lower level somehow we're gonna need the help of operating system, the system call that. Involved actually the actually the data or fetch the data uh, from the uh, hard disk to the main memory is going to be uh, performed uh, through I mean the operating system. Then after that the database management system is going to I mean take care or the control of the top. So again, when the database management system required you need a base, it's going to say I want to find the base. The base is not in my buffer pool. What we're going to do here? I need to issue uh, input out a request to the operating system. Please, I want this base, that base. So the operating system, the only thing you do, take whatever the hardware page and put this one in the operating system page. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, take whatever the hardware and put this one in the buffer pool. Okay? So here, the help, this part is going to be done uh, by the help of the operating system. So the size of this one is a 4 kilobyte. And the size of the operating system, uh, uh, usually 4 kilobytes. And now we take a look at the, at the top, it's going to be the database page. And now he is dependent. It depends on what kind of, uh, I mean, database that we have. I think SQLite and database and Oracle, the size is going to be uh, up to 4 kilobytes. At SQL Server, Postgres, they have 8 kilobytes. That means they're going to store more data. My SQL, the size of the database page is going to be 16 kilobytes. Okay? And, uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. so, so here, hardware page is uh, same as database page? Same as what? The disk? Uh, database page. Like, it, operating system is copying hardware page into disk, right? The buffer. Yeah, I mean, you see, you have a database management system here. Database system, okay? When the database system try to interact with the hardware, with the disk itself, okay? They cannot do this one directly. I have to go through the, uh, I mean, uh, the lower level, let's say, system call is going to go through the operating system. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in order to try to fetch something, or put something, it looks like you can say the database system base, it's going to put whatever you want to put in the disk to the operating system base. And then operating system base is going to uh, store this data to the hard disk page. When you try to achieve my data, at our database management system, the one is going to be responsible, the one is going to say, I want this page, for example, number five. So it's going to find exactly what is the location or position of page number five, then instruct the operating system, say, please fetch that page from that disk to me. Okay, so whatever operating system is fetching from hardware. It's going to so go to the database page. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. because remember that's the only that's one of the minor places that we need the help of the operating system. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. because we cannot interact directly with the disk. We need, otherwise we have to write our own uh, let's say system calls and into uh, ABI and without the system call in order to allow us to directly access the disk. Okay. Oh, yeah, good. So. We do have one thing by the hardware page that's worth mentioning here that it, I mean, we call this one the, uh, we mean here at this level that the device can guarantee what is called the fail safe write. The fail safe write, that means like a special property that it still has that the hardware, if you send any page to try to store this one to the disk, the hard disk is going to guarantee that the four kilobytes is going to be written as atomic as one unit. If you try to send something more than three or four kilobytes, uh, I'm going to, uh, I mean, store the data in the four kilobyte uh, size. 
anything exceed this one, I'm gonna divide this one into blocks of the data, and every time I'm gonna guarantee that I'm gonna store four kilobytes at a time. Uh, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, so why is database page uh, size is 1 to 16 KB? Yeah, it depends on the database system. A database system doing database uh, star, different stuff. For the SQLite, I guess it was 1 kilobyte. Then after that, they increased this one to the 4 kilobyte. And you can adjust. This is what is called, I mean, the default size. But we can modify this one. And many of the database management systems allow you to increase the size. Yeah, but this is the default size. If you check the MySQL, you see the default size is 16 kilobytes. Postgres is 8 kilobytes. The Oracle, 4 kilobytes. I think that because the size is going to increase, I mean, add more data and details, it's going to store, for example, the page ID and the page ID. I'm going to talk about this one later. Each database management system has its own uh, format. The size, for example, I think some of them maybe you can say is uh, hundred uh, has been, for example, uh, just for example, it's not the accurate number. For example, hundred bytes. The other one maybe have two hundred bytes. So increase the size of the page ID is going to be larger because it's going to contains more data. Okay, so when it is my SQL, so uh, like sixteen KB, so it will be uh, four hardware pages and then four OS page like that. It's got, uh, yeah, it's for the, uh, the hardware base is going to have 4, yeah, operating system 4, but the database base is going to be 16. No, no, I'm saying it will be 4 into 4 KB, so like that. Yeah, so now I need to find a way. Now we have the data that's going to be sequence of the blocks. How can you store, I mean, the blocks in the desk randomly? Uh, follow a specific data structure, that's what we try to do. Remember, it looks like uh, we are working the warehouse, okay? And we get the new stuff. I mean, next packages. What you need to do here? You have to find a way, structure a way in order to organize your data. It's like label every package that belongs to whatever, uh, which item, in order to organize this one, put it in the right place. Then later, when you try to retrieve the data, you know exactly how can we achieve or, or uh, access or find out the package that you're looking for. The same thing here, the database management system needs the way in order to find the page on desk, given a page ID. And remember from the higher level, someone will say, I need page 16. You need to find a way how can we get the page 16 from the desk. Okay? So we do have a different, I mean, uh, I, I like this statement that stated that different data management systems do different uh, st stuff differently. Okay? Uh, different database management system is going to manage base and the file and the disk on different ways. The most common way to do that using the heap file organization, which I'm going to cover today. The other one, we can use sequential or sorted file organization. The other one uses, for example, the hash file, or the other one uses three files, or three structures, okay? So the simple way to do that is the heap file. And the heap file that, I don't care, it's like randomly just put this one anywhere, any place you can find. Remember, when you store the data on the disk, we are uh, I mean, familiar with the structure of the disk. The disk is have the cylinders, and you have a tracks, and you have, uh, I mean, uh, sectors of blocks, yeah? When you want to store my data here for the heap file, put it in the first place, the random place. But of course, when you put this one in the random place, you need to figure out, keep tracking where you put it, because you need to retrieve it later, okay? Uh, for the sequential, the one that's sorted file, keep the data sorted, the blocks. Based, for example, it might be you store the data, I mean, uh, I have data and the relation, and the relation can be sorted based on, let's say, the primary key. So I know I bought the data and, uh, in order for the block one, then after that block two, then after that block three, then the uh, rest is going to be block four. When I'm storing my data, I need to try to store the block one, then after that, next to this block, I'm going to store the block two. And remember, we talk about the sequential. You put, try to put this one in the same track if you cannot put it in the same cylinder. Okay? The third one, we can use hash file in order to organize my data. On the fourth one, you're going to use the three files. Later, when you talk about the indexing technique, we are going to cover the hash, hashing file uh, technique and the tree file, uh, uh, I mean, the tree structure that we use in order to build the uh, index. And I'm going to show you, give me a simple idea. After we build the index, I'm going to say, with, with, instead we have index, we are going to have, let's say, a blocks of the data in this case.
So again, just we need to find organized way in order to find or in order to store our data. Then after that, find uh, figure out a way in order to achieve or find our patient later. Okay. And remember here, in this level, this uh, this point, we don't know and uh, need to know anything about the content. Do you need? It doesn't matter. I mean, what's the content of the data? If you try to store the data in the heap file, in more. I mean, when you say content of the data, that means I don't care about. I mean, whether the data is gonna contain, let's say, index, or maybe contains, let's say, uh, tuples or data, or maybe it contains the log records and etc. Okay. So let's take a look at the database heap with the simple thing here. So the heap file again is an ordered collection of pages. So this means we have tuples that are stored in random order. This is the definition of the heap file. Yeah. So instead you have, I mean, in this case, uh, we do have what? We have a collection of pages. That means it's going to be stored where in random order. Whenever you have a space, just store this one. And of course, we need to make sure that in the data structure or the application that you use is allow you to create, to get, to write, to delete pages. And also allow you to support what is called, I mean, uh, sequential access of the data, iterating over all the pages. And in most of the case, for example, assume the file is con contains your uh, data or the informa uh, information that a relation called student. Then later, I need to scan the entire relation. So in this case, in the heap file, once I store my data, I need to make sure that I find a way in order to allow me to iterate over all the blocks that belongs to this file in order to scan or retrieve the entire data. Okay, uh, it needs, of course, some metadata because you need to find a way in order to, uh, or extra piece of information in order to show you or keep tracking where, which, whether the pages exist or not. This one thing, yeah, whether uh, you need to free space or not, because sometimes you need to have store, let's say, tuple somewhere inside the data. Okay, so. It looks like we need to, uh, let me give you a quick here. So this is a file. This assume this is the hard disk, the whole thing, okay? So I can put, for example, one block here, and then after that, one block here, then after that, me put this one here, but, but that one here, okay? So those all, the let's say the blue one, that these blocks that belongs to file one. And maybe we have a blocks that belongs to another file, which is the red one somewhere, yeah? Okay, if I organize my data randomly here, I need to find a way, another way, something. I need to ask, have an extra piece of information. Let's uh, have the yellow here. And this extra piece of information is going to tell me what. For example, okay, this file, you have this is the page ID one. This is the pointer where you can find page ID one. This is the page ID two, is somehow is there. This is a page ID three, and this is the page ID four. Somehow, something like this. Not exactly, but something like this. So this one is gonna like, I mean, uh, metadata that keep tracking where, which the pages exist or not. So let's me, for example, I ask you the higher level data said I need page fifteen. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do here? Assume that we don't have this structure. We don't have this metadata. Okay. So the simple solution that in order to achieve the page. I need to retrieve all the blocks that belongs to this file. Then after that, check all of them. Are you page 15? No. 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 So we waste our time. We perform a lot of disk output out operation with nothing. But if we have this metadata, the extra piece of information or structure, so in this case, I need just to retrieve what is called the directory or page directory. Okay. Then I retrieve this one in the main memory. Then I check. D, can I find page 15 here or not? So it looks like this one is gonna have extra piece of information. Say those are the pages that exist, and this is the location or the where you can find them in the desk. And also, it's gonna say for each page, maybe if I can do something like this, this page, this is the free space available in this page. This is the free space available in this page. Because later, when you try to insert one trouble, I can consult this page directory and tell me exactly where the pages that has enough space in order to fetch to the main memory, then after that, insert the new record or tuple, then after that, you need to write back to the desk. You follow me, guys? So that's the, that's the way that we need to find the structure way in order to store our desk, in the, I mean, the page on the desk. So there's a two way in order to represent the data on the heap file. Okay, I just give you an idea of what we need to try to do here. The first way, which no one used, is based on linked list. 
And the second one, using using what is called the page directory, was the most common or most database management system used this technique. But each of them might be they have a very I mean uh, different implementations. But the, from the high level, the structure is going to be the same. Okay. So here in this case, in the heap file, let me show you. Start with the beginning here. So the heap file is something like this. I need to have like use the linked list. Remember, we are going to store our data somewhere randomly in the disk. Okay, but we need to build the data structure in order to allow me how can we find my way? How can we uh, figure out whether the basic exists or not, whether there is a free space or not? Okay, so here, this I'm gonna build a page or let's say header because I'm gonna implement this one using the linked list. And the linked list is gonna do what? It's gonna have a, a pointer to two different, uh, I mean, uh, lists. Link list. So we have a one pointer here, just has a pointer one here, and another pointer. So this page is gonna contain or compose of two pointers. Okay, each of them is gonna point to let's say uh, a link list. Clear? So this one link list, and this pointer to another link list. In this link list, the first one is gonna point to the head of the free page list. That means it's gonna point to the list of the pages that has space, at least a space. It doesn't mean they are empty, but at least they have space left over. We can store some data inside this one. So I assume this is gonna point to the head of the link list, and this page is gonna point, point to the next page. Maybe we have, for example, two pages, for example, only. They have uh, free space, or they have some space. I know I'm um, supposed my drawing must be uh, accurate, but assume that the size is the same, okay? So inside this one is like, and when you build link list, you know that you have two pointers. One pointer to the previous one, and one pointer to the next one. Yeah? That's what it is. So the, here we have one pointer to the previous one, and one pointer to the next one. If we didn't have anything to pointer to, maybe it's gonna point to the end. There's nothing here. Okay? There, so this is one link list that is going to have what? A free page list. This means the page that contains at least a space. They have a free space. Okay. Then after that, we have a pointer to the page of the list of the pages that contain that has these that four. That there is no free space inside these pages. So assume that, for example, we have three of them. At the same structure, you need to go this one, but this is the subset of this linked list that contains all the pages that full, there's no more space. And this one gonna be contains the list of the pages that have some uh, space left over so we can use in order to store our data. And again, you just have to need to find a way in order to organize by data. Okay, so back here to the slides. So that's what we have. We're going to have a header here. And the header has a two pointers. One is gonna point to head, to, let's say, to the uh, free page list. And this one is gonna be to another free, uh, I mean, uh, data page list which contains uh, the data is gonna be stored here. I mean, these pages are full, there's no both space. How can we implement this one? And we are all going to implement this one with using link list, okay? In our case, we are gonna do the simple uh, case. We are not gonna do implement the linked list. list. We have a simple case, the first coding assignment. You have the file, uh, you are going to blow, store the DO data as a block in the file. You just to store like pointers inside the file using uh, C language. Okay, so you don't need to go uh, with a sophisticated process in order to build the linked list or the page directory. Clear the linked list again. The goal here: I'm going to store my blocks somewhere randomly, but I need to have build the data structure in order to allow me to navigate my way to find my way to see where. I need to uh, check whether the pages exist or not, allow me to recover the page that I'm looking for. So for example, if you're looking for a page, okay, and you came here and decided and say, I want page, uh, specific page, for example. I want to insert, let's say, uh, a new topo. So you're gonna go to the header. Every time you need to navigate your way, you have to fetch your header to the main memory. If you have enough space, then this header or this block must be staying in the main memory. Okay, because the database management system knows that we're keeping access to the data file, so we need this uh, blocking gonna be in the main memory. If we rely on the operating system, which is not the case, so the operating system maybe gonna uh, get rid of this block 
after we fetch the first time to the main memory. Because the operating system maybe is gonna say, I don't we don't use this one for a long time, or maybe we need the space to uh, in the puffer pool in order to fetch another block, so it's gonna get this one vector well block we can't get rid of it. So that causes us trouble because we need to perform another disk on out operation whenever we need to access or fetch data from the file. Uh, from the disk. But we are lucky because the database management system knows better about the structure, knows better what kind of operation you need to perform. So the database management system, the buffer bone implementation is gonna say this header keep this one because this block we are going we keeping accessing the data more frequently so we don't need to waste our time every time to fetch access the data to fetch this block to the disk then after that perform the search then after that you have to get rid of this one then ask, uh, fetch it again in the system. So the similar question here I have a new tuple and they want to insert. So that we fetch this header to the main memory and you can follow this pointer tell you, for example, this the pointer to the first block that contains space. Does this one tell me how much space? No. Based on this structure? No. That's why we said no one you will use this one. Okay? So that means you have to fetch this block to the main memory. Then after that check, do you have enough space to store this tuple? No. Keep Follow, fetch the next, and etc. Sometimes you're gonna fetch too many blocks until you figure out that you don't have enough space. Either you're gonna insert a new block, or maybe the last block in this linked list, the one that has the space. So that's why we said this is not good option. The other problem here, if I ask you, for example, I'm looking for a specific page. I will give you a page number. Based on this structure, we cannot find out the page number easily. How can you find it? The only option for me, I need to scan the entire blocks here. If I didn't find it, I need to scan the fetch the entire blocks here of the pages. If I found the page ID, then it's gonna be perfect. If I don't, that means I have to, uh, so the worst case scenario, I need to scan the entire uh, file in order to tell whether the pages exist or not. Then after that, you fetch. That's why I said, this is not good option or good choice in order to build or start our database. Okay? So the best solution, what, as I mentioned, the most database management system do is the following here. That's what you do. You call this one the beige directory here. So now that we see, if you saw the first lecture, uh, image when you talk about, I mean, I mean when you describe that, uh, what you try to do here on the lower level of the file storage, uh, we do have what is called the directory because they need to find or navigate my way or data structure in order to help me how can I find my base after I store them in the into the disk. So the base directory, directory is like a simple thing here. So one special base, okay? So we're going to have one base and this base looks like something like this. And we'll call this one directory. And this base is going to contain what? It's going to be a special base that tracks the location of the base database and the database files. Okay, the directory also stores, for example, the record, uh, records, I mean, sorry, the number of free slots, bare pages, and also give me, for example, more details. You can tell me whether the base exists or not. So in this case, it looks like here, it's gonna tell me, for example, more details about the page. So what's gonna happen? It looks like we have more data here. Number of uh, free space, okay, and the location for this page, okay? And another one, for the next one, I have the same data. So it's gonna be, give me uh, some metadata, where the data gonna be uh, of the page, this page, for example, located or stored. And also can give me, for example, uh, the number of free slots in the page, and etc. So, of course, you have a page ID here. So here, the page directory, if you try to look for specific pages exist or not, you need to fetch the page directory to the main memory, then you can scan. If you didn't find the page ID here, then done. The page does not exist. So you didn't need to waste your time to scan the entire pages in the desk. The second thing, for example, the same thing if you try to, for example, insert a new tuple in the database. So the simple thing you try to do here is see what? I need to find the blocks that have enough space, yes? So here, just please take a look to the base directory. I can tell, for example, which base that have enough free space in order to store this tuple by just looking for the directory. Once you decide which one you need just to fetch this one to the main memory, then after that you insert the tuple. That's why it is much better than compared to the linked list. Clear, guys? Yes. yes. Okay. So it looks like you are the only one who answer my questions. How about the rest? You still alive, guys? 
Yeah, we're here. Oh, thank you. Great. So, uh, after we're done from the file storage, we have the date and the file. We divide the file into blocks. Then you find a way or organized way in order to store our block in the desk. Now we need to take a look to the page layout in more details here. What do you mean here? What the content the structure of the page looks like from the side? Because I'm keeping have what? I'm keeping talking about the page is going to be like a block. What's inside the block? Not yet. Now we need to take a look how the base looks like from the inside. Okay? So, every base, generally speaking, is going to contain what's called header, which is the one important thing. Inside the base, there is a header. This header is going to, generally speaking, going to contain the metadata about the base content. It's going to help me more uh, understand more details about the base itself. The first one is going to be what's the base size? The checksum, for example, uh, the database ver management system used uh, in order to version that used in order to create this database or this block. You know that you have different. Uh, I mean, uh, your favorite database system that you work with. It has different. I mean, uh, did, uh, I mean versions. So we need to make sure that to store what's the version used in order to create this page. Uh, transaction visibility, for example, you know that you need to make sure that. Uh, who transaction can be able to access this page and who cannot and also conversion uh, information if you use any uh, conversion technique in order to convert the content of the data you have to tell me I'll put this piece of information here in the header because you are going to use this information in order to decompress the data okay so at the beginning it's going to be half a block empty base and at the top it's going to be has we have what's called the header that header that contains metadata about the base content okay some database or some system require the base to be self-contained like oracle so in this case what i need to do i need to store more information or you can say all the information that you need in order to understand the structure of the tuple that's stored in the data uh, in the page itself so for any page storage architecture, we now need to understand how organized the data stored inside the page. That's one thing, okay? And just for simplicity, we are going to take a look only one uh, data types. We're going to assume that we are going to store the tuples, okay, of the relation in this state, okay? So we do have different ways in order to lay out, I mean, the data in the page. The first one, tuple oriented and the second one log structure okay that's based on the storing in the page let's take a look at the, both of them and see what's the difference and when we're going to use both, uh, both of them so the simple thing here this is the tuple storage that means i'm going to show you a simple way how to store the data in the desk okay when you say star man i mean idea that means this is dumb idea don't use it it's not going to work so the simple thing I'm going to say, I'm going to have only be simple piece of information in the header, which could count, I mean, the number of tuples that's stored inside this page. Okay? So every time you try to insert a new page, I need to increase this one by one. Okay? So assume that we have three pages, um, I'm insert the uh, tuples, uh, the, first, the first, the second, and the third tuple that be stored inside this page. Okay? Now we have a three tuple inside the state. What's the contents of the tuple? I don't know yet. Yeah, we assume that we have a fixed length tuple. That means each of them is gonna have the same exact size. For example, 100 bytes each, just for example, okay? So in this case, the first, the second, and the third, okay? So if we take a look here, what do you have, whether we have any problems here or not in this case? So what happens, for example, if you delete the tuple here? The simple thing we're going to do here, I need to scan from the beginning and to find this tuple, then delete it. Yeah? And after that, you need to decrease the number of tuples by one here. So what if we have, uh, I mean, uh, variable length attributes? What do you mean the variable length attributes? Before I go this one, what if you try to append, append, I mean, a new tuple here? So you have two options. Either scan from the top until you find the first space, then after that you store this tuple. Or maybe you need to add extra piece of information to tell you the offset of the size of the one tuple or the offset to the free space within this page in order to store your data. So you have many options here. The problem here, if we work with the variable length attributes, now we have a problem here. Because the variable length, for example, if you delete one or you try to find, I mean, uh, what's it called? I mean, the 
uh, right place or enough space inside the toe base is not easy idea here. It's not easy job. That means we need to insert to add more uh, metadata in order to figure out how can we define, I mean, the free space. And also, how can we navigate my way? How can we jump to that uh, specific topo? Because, if the, again, if the data fixed length, I need just to keep tracking of the size of each tuple here. And for me, it's easy to jump. For example, I need tuple number three or the third tuple. So I need to count 100, uh, uh, the first 100 going to be the first tuple, the second uh, 100 going to be the second tuple, and etc. If you change the order, I need to figure out, it's not easy for me to find the exact tuple because I didn't have anything that added here the header in order to help me in order to answer the square. So that's why it's this bad idea why I'm not going to Cover the. I mean, uh, no one uses this one. So the second one with the most database system doing, we call this one the slotted page. So you see that I'm adding more details. So this one can handle a uh, fixed or uh, variable length double data. Okay. So the same structure. That we have a page, and this page is going to have a header, and inside the header is going to have some metadata. Maybe you can keep, for example, the number of user slots, how many slots I'm mean, use it, or the offset for the starting location for the last slot use. Then we do have data that's going to be divided, or the block is going to be divided in two parts. The first part of the top is going to have what is called the slotted base. It looks like uh, an array, okay? And the array is going to have a pointer to the slot to the specific tuple inside the data, okay? And the slot array is going to keep tracking with the location for the start of each tuple. So, for example, if I'm going, let me give you an example quick here. The same our page is empty, okay, nothing here, and we do have what you call here. Uh, this is a block. Then after, I mean the header, and this is here, for example, the slotted area. At the beginning, I I have nothing, okay, and this is the header. When you insert a new tuple, for example, I insert the tuple number one here. What I need to have, I need to have keep tracking and an offset, add an offset to what. Is going to add an offset to, I mean, to the beginning of each slot. If you want a page number one, this is, I mean, the beginning. You have to jump to this place, then start reading until you finish. Of course, at the beginning, you're going to see later for each block or a page, we, uh, I mean, tuple, we're going to add a header, which is going to tell me exactly what's the size of each tuple. Okay? So point it to the beginning. If you insert a new one, for example, I insert two here. Another tuple, so that means I need to add another slot here, and this is going to be pointed to the beginning of this uh, tuple, and etc. So the way that the data is going to be, uh, I mean, grow here, for the slot, it's going to be from the beginning to the end. This is the way it's going to go. Keep doing this one from the beginning to the end. And the way this, I mean, the tuple is going to be grow, it's going to be from the end to the beginning. At one specific point, they're going to meet in the somewhere in the middle. In this case, we are going to consider this page is going to be four. So again, this is more organized way. So I have a header, I have a slot array. Every time I insert a new tuple, I need to have a pointer in the slot array point to the beginning of this block. Uh, I mean, tuple that I just inserted. So when you try to search here, looking for anyone, which slot you need, you know that the page ID, you need, the address is going to contain the page ID and the slot, the offset within this page. So you know, for example, you need the, the tuple number two. The tuple number two is going to be, uh, the address is going to give in the page ID plus the offset inside this page. So it's going to tell you the offset two. So I have to follow this one in order to fetch this page, uh, this uh, tuple. Okay? So this is more organized way and better way. So we learned that how can we divide the data, I mean, uh, store our file as a sequence of blocks in the desk. Then after that, we figure out a way using, I mean, page direction in order to figure out how can we find our way within the blocks. How can we navigate our way to see whether the block is exist or not? How can we retrieve the specific block? How can you tell whether the block has enough space or not free space or so? Then after that, we start to take a look to the page itself, how, how the page looks like from inside, okay? So the best way in order to do that, we figure out that using the slot page is the best way in order to lay, uh, organize or lay out, uh, I mean, see the structure, lay out the, the, the tuple inside, I mean, the page itself. The other way we call that log structured file organization, which is a different way to perform this one. In this case, the previous one, what I'm, I'm inserting, I'm inserting the tuple itself. And when you mean the tuple itself, it looks like here, we're gonna see the next, uh, I mean, I mean a, few, a few slides, but right now you can imagine that it's going to be as similar to the uh, student ID, name, and GPA, and address, and so on, okay? 
Of course, I'm not going to store like this, but I'm going to show you the structure. That, that's what I'm trying to store here after we transform this one to the general representation. Here, I'm not going to insert the tuple itself. I'm going to insert, the, let's say, the delta of the, uh, the modification about the tuple. For example, when you insert something in the tuple, I'm going to insert the command itself. I'm going to say the log record, I'm inserting the ID 1, for example, and the value was 8. Then after that, you insert a new tuple. I'm not going to insert uh, put the tuple itself. I'm going to just append I mean, the log record. So the content is going to be different. It's not the tuple itself, but the log records. When you say the log records, that means the set of activities that you perform over this table, or this relation, or this uh, file. So for example, what I'm going to insert, for example, in the, insert the store, I mean the entire tuple, and, or delete, or update. This is the modification. Delete, update, and etc. And you keep in growing until you reach, uh, until the, I mean, uh, adding to the end of this page. So, in other words, here we store what? The record of the file, how the database was modified. And I'm interested only for the insert, update, and delete. Okay? Then, when you try to retrieve the data or you read the record, how can you do this one? You have to scan the page backwards in order to start to reconstruct the data or the page. So, the, in this case, it's easy to insert or append the data, and it's hard to read the data because when reading that costs you time because you have to, read, I mean, uh, backwards in order to reconstruct the tuple in order to produce the result that you're looking for. So again, first, uh, I mean, fast writing, writes and also potentially uh, slow reads, and the reason behind this one, we need to reconstruct the base, uh, I mean, the uh, record of tuple that uh, you want to, uh, I mean, uh, use or access to. So there's one way to do that, just to speed up the axis and so to, for example, I'm looking for uh, the tuple ID equal one or two. In this case, I need to scan the entire page right, from the beginning uh, and up to the end, but we can build this, say, uh, hash table or index in the top of this page in order to tell me, for example, how can I find my data? For example, if you're looking for the, I, look, uh, I mean, uh, data belongs to the record uh, uh, or the ID equal to, just follow this one and gonna tell me exactly where we find all the record, uh, I mean, the data that quantified by the record ID equal uh, two. Uh, this is a three, by the way, okay. There is another way to deal with the log structured file organization that you need to do what? I mean, uh, vertically come back, I mean, the log file. We try to rebuild this one. Sometimes since we are um, inserting, modifying, um, and updating tuple, so what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna come back th this operation, I write another insert, it's not, oh, another update to the data, it looks, oh, another insert actually, yeah, it looks like I'm going to insert a new tuple uh, after recording all the modification or updating that happened for the circle. So here, if we have, for example, tuple, and made an update to it. For example, I already insert tuple, then after that, make minor modification or set of modification, maybe five, six, assume that we have a number of modifications to tuple. Instead, in order to read this one again, I need to reconstruct this one, that's required for me to read, for example, five or six tuple, yeah? In order to reconstruct the original, uh, or the new, or the, I mean, the most updated version of the tuple. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to compact all these operations that can happen or modification or insertion or update over this tuple and put this one based on the one in new insert operation. The problem this one, I'm going to rewrite the same data over and over again. But it's going to help me in this case because it's going to speed up the access of the data, but it's going to cost me another, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Right operations. This what happened. I mean, the Cassandra. I mean, on HP base and uh, level database, they work with the log structure of file organization. They use this one in order to organize the data. But mostly for the most database, the relational database management system that you know, they're gonna work. I mean, with I mean the slotted page. This is the best way how to uh, organize the tuple inside the uh, page. Mm -hmm. So, uh huh. Yes, Yep. I did not understand uh, in the previous slide. What do you mean by answer with right amplification? So that means if you have modified the tuple uh, here in the slotted page, the normal thing, I'm going to insert the, inside, uh, the entire tuple. Okay? Assume the tuple that contains, uh, let's say, student ID, student name, and GBA. Okay? 
If you try to modify this tuple, what you need to do here, you have to fetch the entire block to the memory, main memory, then you have to fetch this block, tuple, then modify the data, then after that you have to store the entire, I mean, base back to the disk, yeah? That normally doing. Clear? Yeah. yeah. But this one here, since we are going to store, we are not going to store the tuple itself. We are going to store only the log entries or the log records. What do you mean the log entries? That means I'm going to only store, I mean, the... Uh, action that you're going to perform over the, I mean, the tuple chain. So, for example, mm -hmm. I'm going to say insert student ID equal value, GPA equal specific value. Then after this, I'm going to, that's what's going to be installed, something like this, insert and something, mm -hmm. okay? Then after that, if you modify this ID or GPA with different value, I'm going to say update the ID, and this is the new value and the old value, something like this, okay? So I'm mm -hmm. not going to store the data itself. I'm going to so store the action, or let's say uh, the set of oper uh, modification, mod uh, I mean, uh, operation that I'm going to modify the data or the tuple itself. So in this case, I'm interested in insert, update, or delete. Yeah. Yeah? That's the difference between two different file organizations or structures. Yeah, that is correct. But uh, there it was mentioned, like, uh, um, on the, I think next last, yeah, this, this the one. issue with the compaction is answer with the right amplification. Exactly. So this is the issue with that, what we explain. What happened here, for example, uh, and you try to read the file, what you need, you need to, uh, I mean, uh, read the data, I mean, the page backwards in order to reconstruct the file that you're looking for. Or you need to scan, reconstruct, uh, for example, someone said, I want to... Uh, the user ID, the data that corresponds to the specific user, mm -hmm. yeah, or the student. So what we're going to do, we expect from you to build a tuple that contains student ID, student name, GPA, and etc. Yeah. You don't have this information in one place. In this case, you have this information in one tuple, one place here, if you find the exact tuple. But in this structure, you have to build this tuple for us. So what okay. we're going to do in this case, instead to scan the entire place on the entire page in order to build the tuple, I'm going to say, for example, since I'm modifying a lot and perform many operations over a specific tuple, I'm going to do what? Put the last, I would say, in, perform a new insert, or maybe you can, the simple thing, you can delete this tuple, then insert a new tuple with the most, I mean, modification or most recent data that you update this tuple. So now when you try to read this one, you didn't need to reconstruct the whole bunch about this tuple. You need just to read only one uh, log that has the final data that's stored in this tuple. Okay. So now we've done the first one again. We have the data, the file, the storage, that's, I mean, uh, store the data as the blocks in the, into disk. Then, after that, in the page layout, we take a look at that. How can we organize uh, the page inside the, whatever, the, uh, the disk itself? So we're going to use, I mean, the page uh, directory, yeah? Right? What I have, uh, what, what I've used in the page layout, yeah. What is the question? What well, the data structure that you use here, the base lay layout here. In order to put, I mean, the uh, tuple inside the page. We used the slotted base. Yeah? Anyway, yeah. so now, again, I have the data going to blocks. Arrange the blocks. Then after that, I arrange, I mean, the uh, the blocks itself uses specific data structures. They just show you the heap organization. So we're going to use the page directory in order to figure out or find out which block or where the blocks is going to be stored and how can we access them, whether the uh, which one is going to have a free space and etc. Then after that, we take a look in the page layout inside. So that means how can we put the tuples or organize the data within the page itself? And we adopt that the slotted page. This is the best way in order to organize our data inside the page itself. Now we need to take a look how the tuple looks like inside the tuple itself. Yeah. So the tuple is essentially, I mean, a, a sequence of bytes. This is the simple thing that we can think about. Yeah. And the job of the database management system in order to find a way in order to interpret or translate these bytes into 
uh, attributes or meaningful data in order to work with. Because when you try to store everything, you're going to be stored in this level, it must be as a sequence, it's zero and ones, okay? Of course, we need to add extra piece of information, the only one that understands or can, under, uh, uh, I mean, uh, figure out what the structure, what we stored here, what kind of data is the database management system. So, the simple thing here uh, about the uh, tuple layout is going to be here, you need to add what's called the header, which contains the metadata about the data, about the tuple itself. And this header is going to contain some information in order to help me to understand the sequence of the bits or bytes that's stored inside this one. So at the beginning here, there's a simple thing here. So this is the header. Something looks like this. Uh, sorry, the uh, the, uh, the tuple itself. And I'm going to spend or take reserve, let's say, uh, space for the header. And this header for the tuple is going to do what? It's going to contain, I mean, the metadata about the tuple itself. So it's going to tell me, for example, the visibility info. For example, who's going to access this tuple or who cannot access this tuple. Or, for example, no one can, uh, who the transaction can perform or perform such operation over this tuple or who not, or not. Who's the one that creates this tuple or modify that tuple and etc. Okay, and sometimes it's going to have, for example, bitmap to the null values. Sometimes if you have some attributes are null, it's going to have a pointer to them. It's going to tell me, for example, if you're looking for the first attribute, the second attribute, for example, the data is null, don't waste your time to achieve anything. Yeah? So, we don't need to store, I mean, the metadata about the scheme of the database here. Okay? Because... Let me give you a naive solution here. What if I store the schema here? Do you know what the scheme of the structure of the each tuple here? The schema of the table is going to tell me the structure, uh, describing me the structure of the table itself. So it's going to contain what? It's going to contain uh, mostly two pieces of information. That's what I'm trusting right now. The attribute name and the domain of each attribute. So in this case, I don't need to store the schema here for every single tuple that belongs to the database because it's going to be waste of the space. If you do this one, for the example, for the first tuple, then after that, you're going to store the schema of the database or, or, or the relation is going to be here. So it looks like I'm going to just uh, store this information that's like going to be redundant and going to consume space, which can be used in order to store the data better than to just store for the schema, duplicate the schema that, which can be stored in another place or outside. So uh, maybe you can store this one in another block that contains the schema in order to allow me to how to access the data or to interpret the data here. So again, uh, tuple header, I mean, a tuple layout is going to contain, or uh, has what it's called, I mean, the tuple header which contains the metadata about the tuple. Okay? So now we have a header here, and the rest of the data is going to be what? The attribute data that is going to be stored here. So, uh, what I'm going to do here, what do you mean? That I'm just considering folks in the tuple data. I'm not folks, uh, for example, I'm not going to consider uh, here uh, different data can be stored in the page itself. For example, the indexing and etc. So here, the tuple data is the actual data for the attributes. And assume that when you create table that you are familiar that there's a create command, I mean, a SQL command, you know, I mean, you know, a statement in order to create a table. And here we have a list of attributes and for each of them uh, have like the associated with the data type. So in order to store this one, it's, the attributes is going to be, generally speaking, going to be stored in the order that you create your table. For example, the first attribute is A, that means I'm going to store the attribute A, then B, then C, then D, and etc. Okay? Most database management systems don't allow that the tuple be exceed the size of the page. Yeah, and we're gonna see later uh, a few slides how can we deal with this situation. For example, if you try to insert attribute C and the size of attribute C is larger than the size of the page, how can I handle this situation? We're gonna see whether we're gonna use overflow or maybe use external storage in order to deal with this situation. All right, now think about, I mean, the tuple of it. I mean, I mean, they have a tuple. The structure of the tuple is going to compose the two parts, header and the attribute data. And the attribute data is going to be stored as the same order that specify them when you create the table itself. So, I didn't show you, for example, how exactly I'm going to store integer value or double value. We're going to cover this one later. Okay? So, what if, for example, I have two tables are related? We're going to take a look to what is called the denormalized, I mean, tuple data. 
Okay? Sometimes that the database figure out that this, uh, I mean, the query that you uh, perform over database mainly extracts the data that belongs to tables. Yeah? So it looks like it's better if we join the relations together in order to expedite, I mean, the access, the data or speed up the query processing. Okay? You are familiar with normalization technique. We talk about the database design, and you, you want to generate uh, entity relationship model. Then after that, you go through the normalization. That means you need to define what the good, uh, bad thing. Then after that, you try to find make it better. Or do you define the good thing? Then you try to realize if you have a bad thing in your uh, design, you have to split the data. So normalization, generally speaking, try to do what? Try to split. I mean relations. Denormalization. That means try to join, rejoin them back. And the reason about this one here, just in order to explain the, I mean, the axis of the data. Okay? So we can physically denormalize or rejoin the related tuples and store them together in the same page. So later, when you have a query that tries to extract the data that belongs, or uh, it got involved to join operation from both relations, I'm going to just go to the block, and uh, once you fetch one block, I'm going to find all the tuples that I'm looking for, because the tuples that are going to be, belongs to two, two relations going to be stored in the same block. It's better than if we have, for example, stored the table full information one block or separate block than the bar. So every time we're going to try to fetch the data, you have to go to the block, I mean, fetch one block from the full, then after that, you have to fetch another block that contains the total data from the bar, which cost me, another, I mean, extra disk input out of pressure. So here again, I have, there's the simple case, which the one that I try to avoid here, I'm going to have, for example, uh, uh, block, separate block for the food relation, and I have a separate block for the power relations. And I know here the power relation is going to have a reference, I mean, foreign key, which is going to reference, I mean, to the primary key to the other relations, so it looks like it's going to be connected. Every time you try to access here, you have to fetch, somehow, you need to, I mean, to access the data that's stored in the other table. So here we have a header, the same structure, here with the tuple inside the, the full uh, block, and we have, for example, the attribute uh, data, which A and B. Again, I didn't specify exactly how can you store integer value. We're going to cover this one later. Just now think about it. We're going to lay or we need to store the attributes in the order that we create the table. Okay? Then this is the bar. And here the bar, for example, in our case, assume that we have uh, one tuple and here we have three tuples. Okay? Just for simplest. So every time we try to access the data, you see that can and do this one in one relation, or one table, uh, or one tuple. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to have one tuple. At the beginning, we have a header. Then I need to store the value of A and B. And every time you see this value, if A and B, and every time A is going to be referenced to the, I mean, this relation is going to be referenced to the full, that means I can store the corresponding data that's stored in the other table with the C, A, A. So how many C's do you have? For example, you have a three value of C for the specific value of A. So in this case, I'm going to build one tuple, again, header, A, B, and I know A is going to fetch, I mean, uh, rejoin uh, the uh, data from that belongs in the other block, in the other relation, in the same tuple. So in this case, I need just to repeat the value of C's many, three times based on the data that we have here. So just an example here. So this one data belongs to the full, this data belongs to the bar. So I'm going to rejoin the data, it looks like, and mix the tuple that is going to contain some information that belongs to two different relations. And etc. Continue to do the rest. So this is the first entry. This is the second. And so it's, if you have more data, sometimes maybe you have more data that's going to be stored here. Okay. So using this data, if you try to, I mean, answer a query that involve uh, data from our uh, fetch data from four and bar, so this is going to be much easier for me. Because when you fetch this block, I'm going to find all the information that I'm looking for. So remember, queries that involve foo and bar, uh, and, I mean, attributes belongs to relations. Every time you fetch one block, you're going to find all the information that you're looking for. Yeah. Of course, the size of the number of tuples is going to be less here. But at least it's going to reduce, hopefully, we, uh, hopefully, hopefully that we achieve a less number of this output out of operation. Again, the goal of us here, try to mitigate the effect, I mean, the access to the data, and also try to mitigate, I mean, uh, or reduce the number of this output out of operation you need to perform because it's a bottleneck for the whole database management system uh, performance.
And the reason behind this one, hopefully it was clear last time when we started talking about the desk, how this is going to be layout of the desk, and how to compute the access time. Every time we need to move the header back and forth, and cylinder is going to be rotate, uh, platter is going to be rotate until we find, I mean, the right place at it. Okay, this is going to that thing, this advantage is this structure is going to have what's called make the update more expensive. Why in this case? Because generally speaking, sometimes when you update, you need maybe the update only the value that or attribute belongs either to foo or bar. In this case, every time to fetch one block, it's gonna have less number of tuples. That's me required for me to do more number of disk input out of operation. You compare this one F, you have I mean two separate blocks at each block, or let's say you are going to store the data that belongs uh, to one relation together and uh, the the uh, separately uh, than the relation bar. So in this case, when you try to access the data and fetch one block, hopefully this block is going to contain the number of tuples, at least all the tuples has a header and only two attributes that belongs to the full. That means we may be, be allowed to have more or large number of this, I mean, uh, add tuples can be stored in this part. Okay? The record ID, we do have what's called, as we have what is called, I mean, the tuple ID, we do have what is called, I mean, a record ID. And the record ID here, I mean, uh, it's like a database management system required a way in order to keep tracking of the tuple that's stored inside the database. The same way that it needs to uh, keep tracking to the page, it needs to track, I mean, keep track to the record ID. In the record ID, we can use what is called unique record identifier. For, uh, that can be associated for every single uh, tuple and this record is going to have what? It's going to have the page ID plus the offset inside this page. Yeah, and remember it looks like we have something like this here. So here, this is the page that we have. If we have, for example, I need the record ID for the tuple 2, it's going to have two things. It's going to have the page ID, which page the tuple is uh, stored, and also what's the slot or offset inside this page in order to find my way here. For example, it's going to be number, for example, uh, page uh, tuple two. So it's going to be the page five, whatever, and it's going to slot is going to be uh, one or two. It's going to be two. That means I need to the second slot in order to retrieve my data. Okay. Uh, only use this one only for the internal representation. You cannot use this one in order to perform the query. So next lecture, I'm going to give you like tutorial. We'll try to go through like. Uh, uh, Work with the postcards. I'm gonna show you, for example, uh, how can we identify the record uh, uh, ID that's stored using, I mean, in the my data. And also, we're gonna say, show you and uh, convince you that we cannot rely on your, this record ID in order to retrieve the data because then you're gonna see later. We're gonna what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create a table. Then after that, we're gonna store the table in the desk. I'm gonna show you what's the page ID, what's the record ID for every single tuple that we store in the desk. Then after that, we're gonna perform minor modification, delete, modify the data, and etc. And you're gonna see the record ID gonna be changed every time. Yeah, that's why we cannot rely on this record ID and in order to retrieve the record. I mean, based on the application. But for the internal representation, yes, because the database management system is gonna keep tracking for the record ID. So let me now do like a uh, quick uh, tutorial. Let me check first. I need to go test this one using the postcards. So it's gonna be the same way if you try to use it with different um, database system. Okay. Okay. This is PG admin. I think you can see that. Give me a second. I need my data here. Okay. So what I'm gonna do here, let's have create small table or tiny table that contains this information. Okay, I'm lazy guy, copy paste. Okay, so assume that we have a table A that has the ID and name, so two attributes, okay? And on this one, we create this table. So the table is existed. Now let's fill the table with data, okay? And assume that I'm gonna fill this one with this information. So the ID is gonna be, uh, let's say, Alice, uh, 100 Alice, 200 Pop, 300 Eve, and whatever, okay? Now let's take a look at the information that's stored there. Just to need to make sure that we're on the same page and we understand what's going on. Okay, I just select all the information there, and this is the data going to be stored here. Clear? So far, so good. Now let's show you that the inner representation, how the database management system of the postgres 
uh, identify or create or let's say what the value can be stored to the CID, the I mean the uh, record of tuple ID that uses the Postgres. Okay. In order to perform that, I'm gonna use what is called CTID, okay, which contains the record ID or the tuple ID. In order to perform that, we can use the formula here. You can say C uh, TID comma star or the rest whatever the relation A to the star maybe you can do that and the rest of the A okay uh, or star anyway I'm interesting here so I'm it's like a special attribute we can query okay in order to retrieve the data there I don't know what it did okay so here we see what. It's something new tuple or new column here that contains like a pair value. The first one, the zero means that the data, I think, can we draw here? No, I can't. Anyway, the zero that means this is the base zero and one that means the first offset. Okay, this is the first base, oh, this tuple is gonna be stored here. This is, that means all of them the same page and each of them gonna has like uh, the slot number inside this page, okay? So someone said, okay, can I use CTID in order to let's say retrieve the data? Yes, for now. But remember, if you organize your data, everything can be lost. Okay, that might have a different value. Let's play around. What if I said I want to delete, let's say, specific tuple? Which tuple are you gonna delete? Let's delete someone in the middle, okay? Here, 200. So I'm gonna delete this data and see what's gonna happen. I think I need to use a different one because easy. I'm lazy guy. I delete from A where the ID equal 200. And around here, okay? Then let me give me the value, how the value looks like. So I want just to select all the data stored there. Oh, let me go back here. What happened here? You see that the CTID one, three, the one that used to be zero two of the slot zero or slot two, which used to point to the tuple two, it's not existing. Okay, the system don't organize anything. Still have the slot one, slot three. So slot two is like unused. Okay, so how about we need to insert a new value here? So I'm gonna insert this say new tuple, and this tuple is gonna have like two hundred. Okay, we delete two hundred here. If you check here. I delete 200, so I literally insert a new tuple, 200, and the value is awesome. Even the same value doesn't matter. I uh, run this one, insert this one. Now take a look, see the content here. Let me run again to see what's gonna happen. So let me ask you a question. Where do you expect the new tuple will be inserted? And under what slot? Just speaking, it's gonna insert this one at the end. Okay, let me see. It's but the bot. The, Continue, okay? Remember, because you, uh, it looks like when you delete something, it's gonna be marked as a delete, but it's not gonna change. The place is gonna be there. When this one gonna be completely deleted, when you perform like reorganize your tables or your data. So now you see that if you keep adding, even if you do like the same value, it's gonna be added to the next and the next and the next, okay? So how about I'm gonna perform what's called, let's say, uh, uh, reorganize all the tables that we have. We do have like vacuum for, I guess, let me check here. That just do what? It's going to take a look at the old database, uh, the table that we have in the database, reorganize the data. What does that mean, reorganize the data? Now it's going to take a look and say, oh, I used to have a slot, it's empty. No one is, for example, slot two is available. Now we need to shift from the bottom, it's going to be the one is used to slot three, it's going to be the slot two. The one is slot four is going to be slot four, three, and etc. So it's like reclaiming any space available there, rebuild every single index that we have because now we need to refresh the record ID with the new value. Yeah, it depends on the data that you work with. I don't have a lot of data in my, this machine. I use this one for just for teaching class. The other machine stocks longer because it has more data. But this one will be faster. Hopefully, it will be faster. Okay. When you run this one, it takes a few time and now it's done. Okay. Now let's take a look again. I'm do that query again and see what happened here. If you're on your query here, you see that one, two, three. That's why I said this is the CTID. I'll just give you an idea how the thing can be organized. 
if you have a large amount of data, you're going to see this one maybe uh, going to be changed. You have seen many blocks that didn't get to be stored there. It depends on the size of the block. It depends on the size of the tuples, etc. And again, we don't rely on the, the record ID in order to use, for example, perform our query because it's, it's going to be changed. Okay, It's not, I mean, uh, static. It's not like the primary key that we have the data as well. So right now, if we try to retrieve the data that have the CT ID, for example, 01, you see that uh, later when you, or 02, later maybe you're gonna have a different tuple. It's gonna be point to another tuple after you organize the data. Okay, hopefully that at least explain or show us what's going on in this part, okay? So take a look, what we did so far, we took a look at the database itself, and database is organized in the files, and the files can be organized in the base, and we figure out, find out the data structure in order to allow me, in order to find, uh, keep talking to the pages within the desk, and also it can retrieve uh, and tell whether the pages exist or not, and we use the page directory in order to take care of this one, and also after that, we take a look, I mean, to store, I mean, the ways to store the pages, yeah? And we go through, I mean, I mean, uh, slot page was the best way in order to organize the, the uh, page. Then after that, we take a look, how can we store the tuples itself? And I guess now we are ready to take a look to how can we store, I mean, the attributes within the tuple itself. It was the internal representation. For example, once you have in the tuple, we have a student ID, student name, etc. Each attribute is gonna have its own, let's say, uh, data types. So we need to find a way in order to how can we deal with different data types, how, how can we store them in the desk and etc. Okay, so next I'm going to take a look what's called the value representations and we continue talking about the storage model in more details. So we're going to continue our discussion about the database, database storage, okay. So what we did so far here, we still try to solve the first problem, okay. In other words, how the database management system is going to represent, I mean, the data in files on desk. What we did so far, we start with the files, okay, or file. Then we said the file is going to be breaking down into a sequence of blocks or pages, and we can lay out these pages on the desk. Yeah, we show that show you that we have a different ways in order to organize or different file organization in order to allow me to keep tracking for these blocks that are stored in the desk. Then after that, we take a look at that how can we organize the page itself from the side, how it looks like. Then after that, we took a look at how can we lay out the tuples inside this desk this page itself. But we didn't say anything about well, how can we determine our, anything about the internal, represent, internal representation, the actual bits that for the value that's going to be stored in the top. For example, last time we stopped at the part that we have a tuple, and inside the tuple is going to have a table and then have a variable data. Now we need to take a look how can we store the variable data in binary representation is going to be stored in the desk, how it looks like. Then after that, we're going to talk about the system catalog, which I mean the way that the database management system can tell whether or and relation exists in table or not, in database or not, whether the there's an index or not, and etc. Okay, and then after that we start. We're gonna talk a lot, a lot, uh, take, take a look at the different storage models, different way to how to store the data. So far that we saw the data in tuple based or the row based, we can see that we have a different storage model. We call this one column based. Uh, we're gonna see how can we do this one in order to store our data in column based. Then after that, I'm gonna go through a few examples, just show you different example ways how can we modify or modification of the tuples. We're gonna update or delete or insert and etc. Okay. So so here the tuple storage here, tuple essentially is the sequence of bytes. And remember last time we said the tuple is going to do what it looks like. You have a tuple is going to have a two parts header and also it's going to have the uh, attribute value or data. Yeah. But the data is going to be like bytes, like a sequence of bits. Okay. So it's the job of the database management system in order to help us a little interpret. I mean, what kind of information is going to be stored there? Yeah. For example, this is the value that uh, corresponds to this attribute. At the same time, the operating system doesn't know anything about the content here. What's going on, the only thing that the operating system understands is this part they say, this is byte of sequence of data, of something. What is this? I don't know. Okay? So the database management system catalogs 
which contains, I mean, the schema information that is going to help me about all the tables stored in the database, and also tell me, for example, what the tuple layout. We say the tuple layout because the schema of the uh, catalog database, I mean, uh, database system catalog is going to contain the schema. What do you mean by the schema? It's going to be the structure or describing the stru structure of all the tables that stored in the, um, in the database. So by describing the structure, I know that, for example, the attribute A is going to, the data type is, for example, integer. And the attribute B, that's stored in this relation that the data type is virtual or whatever. Okay? So what we have right now, or what data that we have, we have this, I mean, the data items or the attributes that we can define. It might be salary, it might be name, it might be date, picture, whatever. So different types of data. And what we have available here to store the data is byte. Okay, that's what you consider as 8 bits. So, now the question here, how can the database is going to store these bytes for values? For example, how does it, we do have different, I mean, uh, data types, okay, that can be stored in the tuple. It might be integers, it might be a variable position, I mean, numbers, or fixed point position numbers. I'm going to talk about this one more details. It might be variable length values and uh, dates and times. So in other words, I do have, for example, integer, I do have maybe float number, double, blob, uh, date, times, tam, so different data types, char, var, char, etc. We have a different data types, and we need to figure out a way, how can we I mean, store them in the disk? So all these data types that we have can be one of the following categories, the integers up to the dates and types. So this take a look at one at a time from the data representation with more details. So the way, I mean, uh, how the database store the bytes for the value, for example, for the integer, big integer, small integer, tiny integer, we are going to use the C or C++ representations here. What does that mean here? That means the way that for the most of the database management system that used in order to represent data from the type integer or big integer or small integer or tiny integer, it's going to do the exact thing that or the technique uh, uh, representation uh, algorithm or technique used in C or C++. In other words, what they're going to use is they're going to rely on what is called IEEE 754 standards. This one. Okay? So that means if you write your code in C or C++ and you create this data, for example, as, say, integer or big integer or tiny integer, so the same exact representation for the database is going to rely on the same exact uh, representation that used by the C or C++. So I didn't need to convert to perform any conversions. For the float of the year, and against, against I mean, uh, the numeric and the decimal, it's different here. So we're going to see that for the float and the year number, the database management system is going to use or rely on what's, I mean, the sta IEEE uh, 754 standards in order to sort the data. Which we do have a problem in this case because if you have a float in the real uh, data type, we cannot guarantee that the accuracy of the data. Okay? If you use the numeric and decimal, that means you have to use the fixed point decimal. I'm going to show a uh, fixed point decimal that in order to ensure that the accuracy of the data is going to be reserved. So I'm going to elaborate this one later in more details. Okay? And for the var char or the var binary of text, the blob, etc., this looks like here I'm going to use what is called, I mean, the variable length values here. So you can specify like an array, and this array that, for example, if you have a char 5, let's give you a quick example here. If you have a, var, a char 5, the simple thing I can do here, I can generate like create an array, and the array that contains this information. For example, the first one is going to tell me, for example, how many bytes. I'm going to use 5 bytes. And here I need to store one, two, three, four, five. This is the way that I'm going to store the chart, for example. The size of the chart and the five, that means I'm going to use five char, uh, bytes in order to store the chart. If you have a var char, var char, you can use different, uh, we call variable size, that means in this case, we have different ways, the simple way that the same thing that I did with the char, you have to use, for example, if the, you said var char n, that means you have to reserve n plus one bytes. Use one first byte in order to decide the size or the number of bytes that are going to be stored here and the rest of the n bytes in order to store the data. Sometimes you are not going to use utilize all the bytes that you reserve. Yeah, reserve. So one way to perform that, maybe you can reserve n plus 1 and 
the rest of that you're gonna you are not gonna use maybe you have a special character that, in order to identify that the database management system this part is not used so if you try to compress the data you can uh, eliminate this part I'm not going to focus in the virtual more details, just I'm interested to show you that what's the difference between float and the real number and the uh, numeric and decimal number. Uh, for the time and date timestamp, uh, it depends 32, 64 bits integer, it depends on the data type that you work with, a database management system, but most of the database system they start, I mean, uh, Store, I mean, the number of microseconds since the unique epoch, that means the January 1st, 1970. Okay, so let's take a look to the engineers more details. Here. As we said, the engineers that means most, I mean, for uh, the way that what the data, most database use here to, in order to represent the dates, uh, and the engineer is gonna rely in the same way that used in the COC. So you define this one, an engineer it's gonna be the same uh, representation. So since we're writing our code in C or C++ with the case of the postcards, for example, uh, you're going to see that you just generate an integer, then you are fine. Okay? So you didn't need to have a special handle technique in order to deal with. For the uh, variable any procession numbers here, this is a different story here. The variable procession numbers is the one that when you define your variable as a float or yield or double. If you do this one, and that's what you are familiar with any programming language, we try to avoid these data types if we um, try to reserve the accuracy of the data. If you have a working with the monetary data or with, say, scientific information data that I prefer to use, for example, a uh, big decimal number or whatever, in terms of the Java, for example. Here, we are not going to use the float, uh, real integer, double. We're going to use the different data types. We're going to use the numeric or the decimal. Okay? So, again. If you define your data variable position numbers, so that means it's going to be this is the internal, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what you call, I mean, the uh, standard that's used by C and C with IEEE 745 uh, uh, standards. And this is just for your information, it's, just, it's like uh, industrial specification of how to represent, I mean, the numbers uh, in internal. So this kind of information. Uh, data types is fast, okay? Because the reason behind this one, I don't need to have a special handling of these data types. I mean, like the, uh, whatever, C of C++, if you do, uh, use my code in order to define my variable and done. It's gonna take care for the rest. And so for the float and the real double, we don't have a problem, but we do have, I mean, for the representation, but we do have a problem with the accuracy, that's what we call rounding errors. I think all of you are uh, familiar with the rounding uh, errors, that means we try to store or represent the data in the say, in, in real numbers, and you didn't have enough uh, space in order to represent the serial numbers. It looks like we have an overflow. For example, the digit, maybe, for example, the digit number can be stored in within, let's say, uh, for example, 32 bytes, and the data gonna be gonna be stored in more than 32 bytes. So what's gonna happen for the numbers? Gonna gonna be left out. It's gonna be rounded to the nearest one. That's why we have a problem. That's why we have one problem with the rounding uh, issue. So I'll give you an example here. If you write this code in C language, okay, and here, you, what we did here, we tried to compute. I mean the I mean the addition for two. Uh, I mean float numbers, and the result we expect is gonna be 0.3. Then we compare this one with the constant value point of three. And we enforce the system, please give us up to the 20 decimal, uh, I mean digits after the decimal points. Yeah? If you run this code here, we expect the result is gonna be the same. But if you take a look here, what's gonna happen here, that's the different uh, representations that we have. The actual representation side the system looks like. So if you said x plus uh, y here, the result is gonna be 0 0.3, it's gonna be 0 0.3, so not accurate one. If you said 0.3 the, as the I mean, uh, constant value, try to print this one, you figure out that the result is not accurate. It's not the same. So we do have a problem here. So again, in order to, if you have the data type that I'm going to deal with, or if the user uses the numeric data or use the decimal data, that means this the numeric or decimal data type is going to be represented differently. Okay? If the user use the float or the yield or double, whatever it is, uh, when the user creates a database, uh, I mean the relations, so we don't have a problem. We can just use the float or yield number that uh, defined uh, using the IEEE 745 uh, for standards or specified by that uh, standard. 
So in this case, what we're going to do here is with the data representation, I'm going to use the fixed point precession numbers. Within this case, the numeric data types with arbitrary precession as a scale. That's why when, if you are familiar with Boston graphs, for example, when you create the numeric data types, you need to specify two things. I mean, mainly. The first one you're going to say is numeric, and you say this is the precession, and also you need to specify the scale. So what's the precession here? This means, I guess, if I recall, yeah, this is the number of digits of both sides of the decimal numbers. So, for example, yeah, let we have an example quick here. If I define, the user define this data, I mean, types, for example. I need to finish typing in order to see your yeah, force, okay? If you define something like this, numeric, for example, 10 and 20, uh, uh, comma 2. So, I mean, the uh, the uh, the precession is, uh, I mean, 10, and the scale is 2. So, the precession is going to tell me, us identify the number of digits, including both sides. When you say both sides, this means the number of digits that before the decimal point and the after decimal point. That means you're going to see 10 numbers in total. Two of them after the decimal point. Okay. So how can we store this information here? So typically, in order to store this information here, I need to modify or create or do more effort in this case. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to store this one in special, I mean, uh, data structure or structure, okay? And this one is going to store this information, numeric value or the decimal value, the similar way that we use the bar chart, kind of. It looks like I'm going to store the number as a string. Then after that, I need to find a way in order to recover or achieve the original data. But you have to be in this case, I mean, the performance penalty because you have to do a lot of work. I'm going to show you the problem in order to get the accuracy. So this is the way that the numeric, the poster graphs, if you take a look to the numeric file, I mean, uh, uh, .c, yeah, you see that how they use uh, working with the numeric data and uh, with uh, and more details, you see that they have, special handling in this case. If you have a float, a float, a float, we say with decimal, the only thing you need to do just to define this one as a float, done. But if you want to you define this one as a numerical, etc., that means there's a special handling in this case. So we have a write a code, in this code you have a structure, the structure is going to have the number of digits and the weight and scale, etc. So some of them is going to be, it depends, some of them is going to be telling you the total number of this, uh, I mean the both sides, then after that the scale is going to count, I mean the number of decimal digits, Digits, I mean, in the fraction part, yeah, and it says that the positive and the negative, and you see the data is going to be stored at the numeric data or digit. All the data is going to be stored as what, as a char. So that means if you have three point five five, it's going to be three five five stored together as one character. So we have we keep the accuracy one hundred percent, but we need to find a way in order to interpret the state. So if you take a look, if you want to uh, see, for example, more details, go, you can check, I mean, Postgres source code is available, and you check the numeric.c file, and you see that this is the way that you're going to handle just add two numeric data or file, I mean, data types. You see that the job is too large. You have to perform large code in order just to add two numbers or two data, I mean, uh, attributes uh, from the numeric data types. And if you compare this one, you try to compare, uh, for example, add two attributes from uh, poorly, uh, let's say from uh, float number, etc. The only thing you see this is the first number plus the second number, because you didn't need to do extra job and take care for the internal representation, convert this one special card in order to make to, I mean to uh, to handle in order to achieve the accuracy, etc. Okay, so. Again, I've, I spoke about this one, I talked about this one before, when you talk about the variable length data here, it looks like here we have an array in order to store the var char, var, var, uh, binary text, uh, blob, add, etc. So it like has a header that keeps track of the length of the string. You remember we saw that the char and the var char said they have like uh, an array of bytes, and we need the header of the first byte is going to keep track of the number of bytes that used. Yeah, it makes it easier for us in order to jump the next value. We need to make sure that we have a, uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, correct structure and easy structure in order to allow me to navigate my way within. I mean, uh, find the exact thing. Why I need to keep again in this case if I have a var char or binary 
or binary, etc. I need to uh, keep track of the number of the size or the number of bytes used in order to see to jump to the next one. Because remember, what I'm going to store here is store this one all the information there as a sequence of bytes. I'm not going to have the pattern. I'm not going to say the first one is going to start from this part of the then done. No, all of them are going to be as a sequence byte, and the header is going to help me in order to decide and navigate my way in order to jump which data uh, or jump to the next value and etc. So, what if I mean that's what's going to be? So here it's going to be a is going to be some sort of bytes, bytes, whatever based on the conversion that we have. Then what if we have a situation that one attribute value is exceeds the size of the single page? What they need to do in this case? So in this case, remember the base is four kilobytes. Yeah, for example, Postgres, and you want a database page, and you try to insert, I mean, a new tuple, tuple, and the size of tuple one value of this attribute is exceed, I mean, or the, exceed, I mean, the size of the whatever, I mean, the database uh, page. So in this case, I need to deal with this one in two different ways. The simple thing, I can store this, I mean, the value that caused the problem or larger than the page in what is called the overflow page. So you create another page, and this page, when you create that page, that means you create a new page, and this page is going to have the same structure. It's going to have the same structure for any single page. Yeah? And this page is going to have a header, it's going to have offset uh, slots, slot, uh, uh, base, I mean, uh, array, and etc. No, no, and the way that was stored, they did the same way that we did in the rest of the page. It's a normal base, but it's going to contain information that, and here in this case, I need to keep tracking uh, or add the address for where can I reach this page. It's going to be the base ID, and it might be the offset because you need to find a way how to get access to this one. So, when I'm going to use the separate overflow, it depends on the database. The database management system they, they do different stuff. Okay, for the Postgres, they call this one toast. Okay, which I mean the oversized attribute storage technique. If you want to learn more, you can click about this one in order to learn more about what this technique looks like. It's like overflow. Okay, and this overflow that I'm gonna decide when I'm going to decide on the database management system or Postgres is gonna decide to store this data in the overflow page or the toss technique. If the size is exceed or greater than t two kilobytes, so whatever the attribute that try to store the tuple is greater than two kilobytes, that means you have to store this one in external or in overflow uh, page. For the my SQL is going to do the uh, I mean the if the overflow is going to use the overflow if the size of the tuple or the attribute is greater than the half size of the page. Okay, for the SQL server is going to be the overflow if the greater than the size of the page. So if equal or less than a little bit the size of page is fine. If exceed the size of page, that means you have to store this one in overflow. Someone one day say, oh, the same problem here. So if they exceed the size of page, how can you deal with this one? Now you're gonna deal with different story. You can use the fragmentation, you have to divide this one into or oh, compress the data and etc. Whereas that's out of scope with this part, that's the only thing you need to think about here. That means if the size of the data or the total or the say attributes is greater than the size of the page or it depends on the criteria, different databases do different stuff. That means you have to store this data or this tuple is going to be stored, let's say, on the uh, overflow block page. The other thing that we can use uh, alternative, alternative approach, we can use external value storage, which is a different story here. So that system, some system allow you to store that I'm not going to use the page inside the database. No, I'm going to use external files. So that means, for example, assume that the C is the movie, okay? Mission Impossible, whatever. Yeah, and this one maybe 2 giga or 3 giga, whatever, gigabytes. If I store this one in the giga, keeping that, it's going to consume the space in the, my database. And also, it's going to require for me to have too many disk input auto operation in order to retrieve the whole data. I have a solution. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to specify a path on the specific day and the, my file, and to store this file well. And they keep just have the path of the way I can find the file or the rest of the data in the external file. Yeah, okay? So it's treated as like a blob page. And the Oracle called this one by a binary file, I think, B5 data types, which is going to deal differently. For the Microsoft, it's going to have this data type, it's going to be use the file stream. Okay? 
And the problem with this one, the database management system cannot manipulate the content of the external files. In order to access one, that means you have to use whatever this file uh, written, what software or application written by in order to manipulate this one. But we have two different major uh, things here. The one that use the I mean use the variable length uh, I mean I mean sorry the large value I gotta use overflow storage based. If I do this one, that means I'm still being able to use whatever the database management system is gonna offer. Remember that if the system try to modify the data in the overflow and the overflow is a crash or something disk failure etc., I can't use the log recovery that provided by the database management system in order to restore the OJA or the you see the consistent state. But in this case here, no, it's outside of control of database management system. But the good thing here, since as I mentioned that I'm going to store maybe uh, data is like uh, uh, movie pictures that has a large amount of space, so it's better to store this information in the external, uh, as external, I mean storage or external file. We do have something here. I need to add here, for example, if you have an overflow page here, that means I need to... If you have an uh, use an overflow page, if the size of the attribute is greater than the size of the page, I can use uh, compression technique in order to compress the data. And the most of the things that the data is going to be used the overflow uh, page or going to be larger than the size of the page, mainly it's going to be static data. So in this case, it's okay to uh, I mean uh, compress them because once you need uh, access to the data, I can encompass them and it looks like I'm not going to modify the data uh, more frequently. Uh, professor, yeah, I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, so in this uh, size of the page is four KB, right? Yeah. So then, uh, why Postgres like it is mentioned for Postgres? The, the size is like greater than 2 KB and then for MySQL greater than half half of the size of the page. Then so each is, one, get, as I mentioned, each database system is going to do its own way to implement that. But that is not uh, larger than the size of the page, right? No, no. For this one, is this one, uh, because this one, uh, for, uh, for the Postgres, they have a different way uh, to deal with this one. The, they use the toss. Toss is gonna use the overflow if the file or the, the attribute is greater than two kilobytes. You have to do the toss. You have to use overflow. That's the Postgres. This is, I mean, I just tell you, I mean, the idea, the situation okay. that if the okay. attribute you try to store is like greater than the size of the page, we need to act. But remember, different database systems do different stuff. Each of them is, it has its own idea, own way in order to implement that. So that's why for the Postgres, they uh, say if they're greater than two uh, kilobytes, we have to use overflow. For the MySQL, if you're greater than half of the size, you have to do overflow. Okay, okay, okay. Clear? Good. So there's one paper, if you're interested, I know it's all paper, but still said whether you use Blob or not, whether you're going to use, for example, uh, external storage or not, so if you have a file or not, if you have time, you can check this one. It's interesting, I mean, if you have a chance to, or you're interested to eat more. Um, now, take a look at the dates and times. We cover this one, but it doesn't hurt if you repeat this one again. Usually, it's going to be represented as the numbers of uh, micro or milliseconds. This is the most database management system. But remember, my, that might be the minor variation. Oh, it looks like this is the standard, but everyone is going to have its own way in order to implement the stuff, to be different. So most of them are going to use, since, I mean, the count the time, the number of milliseconds or seconds or microseconds, since, I mean, the unique epoch is going to be, I mean, January 1st, 1970. Okay? And as example, time, date, and timestamp, of course, each of them is going to have different size. Each of them is going to have, like, I mean, uh, 32 bytes, for example, 64, and etc. That's what we're gonna when you represent, I mean, our the attribute in the tuple. Okay, so, I have one uh -huh. more question. Uh, so, out of the two, like, uh, um, in case of overflow or the external value, which one is preferred? Or it depends on the an implementation, I can tell. So, that's why you see, that's why you need to read more about the actual what the boss is doing in this situation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Many are gonna use overflow here. Yeah. 
But as I mentioned, some of them, it's better. Sometimes you have external file that, what if the size of the data, for example, as the movie, is three giga or 100 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. So for the user, it's better to do what? Do your external file. Okay. That's better, yeah. And especially, mm -hmm. it's like static data. You're not going to modify the data. For example, when you fetch or perform a query and set up, generally speaking, you're not going to achieve this one every time you ask the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the system catalog, we talked about this one before, is like the database management system must store metadata. You we need to know, for example, a way that to know the structure of the database that we want, we store the disk. Yeah? The tables, the relations, for example, the attributes, the structure of the attributes, because I know the structure of the attributes, I know the size, I know how can we retrieve the data. Okay, so we need to find, for example, information about the tables, about the columns, for example, index, views, users, permissions, uh, statist internal uh, statistic information, this, for example, uh, the number of unique uh, value for specific attributes. We're going to use this one later when you talk about the query optimization in order to figure out the best way in order to find the best plan you want to execute the query. So we need to get back to the internal statistic information in order to get, in order to try to help us in order to estimate the size of the uh, or the uh, cost estimate, estimate the cost for you in order to execute the query and etc. So anyway, we need to have a metadata about the data, yeah, which is going to be stored in the internal catalog. Okay, so the metadata as a mission contains information about the tables and uh, an index views and etc. Almost every database management system store these data in the catalogs in itself. So this means it's going to be stored this one inside the database system, yeah. And now we have like a dilemma here, because every time you try, for example, to access the data or the access file, you need to consult the schema, yeah? And now the schema or the database uh, metadata or the schema of the catalog, it's going to be stored inside the database. So that means it's going to be stored in file inside the database. So it looks like in order to access the internal schema or let's say the system catalog, you need to consult the system catalog in order to find the name of the relation in order to access the relation and also then in order to figure out the structure or how the data is going to be stored inside the relations. Because remember, it's going to be file and file can be, uh, I mean, uh, break it down into a, sequel or a bunch of uh, blocks and these blocks is going to be stored in the desk. But what they're doing here, they, it looks like they have object abstraction around the tables. It looks like we have a special in our, uh, when you build the database management system, they have like exception uh, uh, way in order, or uh, a unique way in order to deal with the system catalogs. So in this case, it looks like we have a special uh, specialized code in order to take care, access the catalog data or table with different way. So it's not going to access the way, that, uh, similar the way that we access the normal relations. So how can we access the system catalogs? I guess most of you or all of you are familiar because you work with the database for a long time. So we know that, for example, how can we query or how can we access this information schema? Although it's internal data used by only the database system inside because in order to figure out what kind of uh, uh, navigate their way and figure out what uh, relations stored, how can we extract or interrupt, I mean, the relations that are going to be stored in this uh, sequence of bytes in the desk. But and the standard or SQL standard allow us in order to, for example, to provide us with some SQL query, allow us in order to retrieve or access these, uh, these information. Plus, most of the database management systems, they have like non-standard shortcut. So that means instead you use, I mean, the standard for, I mean, uh, way in order to query, let's say, the information schema, it's allow you to use the shortcut in order to access or retrieve this information. So the first one here, this is, I mean, in order to list uh, all the tables that are in the current database, that's what we're going to cover. We, this is a SQL 92 standard, you're going to say select a star from the information schema dot tables uh, where the table catalog equal the database name that you're looking for. Either we need uh, whatever, if you put the database, it's going to give you the database itself. Anyway, so in this case, that the standard set, you can do something like this, but if you are familiar with the podcast, you can do slash D. If you are familiar with my SQL, you can use show tables only. So it looks like it's like shortcut is gonna internally implement this uh, SQL 92. Uh, and, I mean, uh, 
statement in order to allow us in order to list all the tables in the current database, etc. As I mentioned in the next uh, lecture, I'm going to try to maybe spend the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes to give you like uh, some practice. Uh, I mean, uh, we tried to do like uh, some experiments to see uh, using the postgres to store the data. How can we retrieve the schema? And they tried to put all the data. I mean, uh, uh, I mean the tutorial that we're gonna do uh, next week in one or two files. So you allow you to share it with you, so you can test this one your uh, and on your time. So. In order to access the table schema, we can access them similar. Use. This is the standard for the SQL 92. This is the way how to access. It. Uh, I mean that. Uh, I mean the columns for the specific table, and this is for the Postgres. You have to slash d and the name of the relation that are, I mean uh, display. I mean the columns for the specific table. For the MySQL, it's gonna just describe a student, and SQLite is gonna dot schema student. Answer. So each database management system does things differently. They have like we have something standard, but each of them has its own way. Each of them is gonna try to be uh, come up with something to be special. So we're done for the data representations. So so far, I guess we're ready to finish the coding assignment one. Thanks, guys. That's all for today. See you next week.